I'm going to text him now saying, don't even. All right, everybody ready to go? Wow, the audio sounds really good tonight up here. Um, welcome, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Um, Vivian, can we get a roll call, please? Commissioner Dawson? Here. Commissioner Conway? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Wax Maxwell? Here. Commissioner McKelvey? Here. Commissioner Paul Miss. So both Commissioner uh, Gordon and Paul Hamas uh, just texted me. They're out sick and are not going to make it tonight. Mike's at a, another thing and can't get here. So um, that's all right. We have a quorum. So next on the agenda is approving the minutes, I believe. There is a little discrepancy. Tess uh, emailed the minutes, the, the minutes at the last minute. They look fine to me. Did everybody get a chance to look at those? I, okay. So, um, we clarified you can still vote on it, but you, you wouldn't know if the content was correct or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, hearing that, uh, let's move to approve the minutes. I move to approve the minutes for, uh, what are the dates? Somebody help me here. November 30th and... December 21st. Thank yes. you. Yes. November 30th and December 21st. Second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I wasn't here, so I have to stand. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good. And then do you have the agenda? All right. Uh, minutes are done. I will now open the public hearing on our uh, first. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I know I was forgetting about something. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Chair Kennedy, mm -hmm. we've got uh, statements of disqualifications and oral communications before the Thank you, thank hearing. you. Flustered for a moment. Uh, are there any statements of disqualification from the commissioners? Seeing none, any oral communications from the public? Oral communication is uh, time, I see you, uh, to hear from you about items that are not on the agenda tonight. So any, anything that's not on the agenda, come on up. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind just stating your name uh, clearly, that helps the, the clerks get it down. I'm number one on the list. Fantastic. I'm Jill Wynn, and uh, thank you for your service to our community. 
At your November meeting, I promised to return in January with an update. In November, I said I was dismayed. Architects Matz and Britton used only the term beige to describe asbestos composite siding on an existing home in my neighborhood while identifying the existing roofing material as asphalt composite in a project submission to planning department, which included some demolition. Today, I provide you with copies of letters and email I wrote to prior to plan approval to planning, public works, and the building department where I outline very specific concerns about asbestos, asbestos removal and public safety. And while there were 29 conditions of approval listed on the project by the planning department, none were specific to public safety regarding the exterior asbestos composite siding removal. I vacated my own home during asbestos removal and returned to find asbestos composite siding debris in my yard. This is unacceptable. Something is out of whack if tonight you are reviewing a report on the number of volunteer trees breaking through, breaking through asphalt in, on a commercial lot on the site of a former gas station and valid public safety concerns are not addressed in the planning department. I'll be back in April with my next update. Are you in contact with staff and working with somebody or do we, should we connect you with someone to talk to? My understanding, this is oral communications. We really can't discuss this, but I'm, I'm not used. Last time, someone said they would be back, and no one has been back. So, okay, uh, staff, could you just get her some contact information oh, we'll to follow to up? It. All right. Um, I don't have much context on that, but it sounds like someone should look into it. Thanks. All right. Any other oral communications, ma'am? Hold on. All right, she's gone. Uh, great, with that we'll close oral communications. We did the minutes out of order. So um, let's dive into the public hearing. Can we get a staff report, please? Ah, yes. Good evening, Ryan Bain. Maybe wait for Samantha to get back, I don't know. Senior planner, I think, I think we're all right. Um, before us tonight uh, is a project at 11, a proposed project at 1130 Mission Street. Um, in terms of site location, it's a approximately uh, 0.287 acre project. Site consists of two parcels that are located on the northwest corner of Mission and Laurel Streets. Um, com commercial uses um, surround the site along Mission and Laurel, um, with the exception of some re of residential uses directly to the west and then across the creek to the north. Um, the flat site is mostly paved um, with commercial buildings um, that are proposed for demolition as part of the application. And there are seven trees that are located on the site, two of which qualify as heritage, heritage due to their size. So being proposed um, tonight is a, a five-story mixed-use project with at-grade parking and uh, commercial space and 59 um, single-room occupancy units. Um, a pre-app was uh, submitted and approved in January of 2023 um, it was deemed complete, and as a result, the proposed project became subject to the ordinances and policies in effect at the time of the pre-application completeness. Um, so the formal application, which is before the Planning Commission tonight, is not subject to either the rezoning or um, uh, city objective standards that were adopted after that um, pre-app was deemed complete as part of SB 330. So the general plan designation for this site is a mixed-use uh, medium density. Um, it calls for businesses that serve the general needs of the community, including retail, service, and office establishments. Typical uses in these areas include restaurants, grocery stores, furniture stores, et cetera, as well as uh, mixed-use projects um, that include um, these commercial uses on the ground floor. Um, the community commercial designation also allows a floor ratio range from 0.75 to 1.75. Um, the proposed project, FAR, is 3.86, um, and a waiver to FAR is included as part of the density bonus waiver, which um, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, there are numerous general plan policies the project is consistent with and is listed in the staff report. I just pulled a couple of the obvious ones um, that are most applicable, um, discouraging strip commercial development in favor of a clustered commercial and mixed-use development. Um, along transit corridor, which this project um, is doing, 
encouraging higher intensity residential uses and maximum densities in accordance with the general plan. Um, where possible, site buildings on the street at the street frontage and place parking areas away from street corners into the rear buildings, which this project does. Uh, also on major corridors, encourage mixed use development, especially projects with priority for commercial uses that can provide services to the adjacent community. These are just a few of the general plan policies. Um, the, the project location is also within the Mission <coughs> Street urban design plan area. Um, specifically, it's located in the west side zone. And so um, the vision of the plan is to, of the Mission Street plan is to reestablish Mission Street as a vibrant um, commercial corridor that recognizes and carefully balances its functions as both a state highway and local serving commercial street. Um, as noted in the plan, the corridor should maintain a predominantly commercial mixed use character. Um, residential uses should be restricted to multifamily um, and to residential above ground floor retail. And the, pro and the project meets all of these goals. Uh, a mix of higher density residential and office uses along Mission um, will complement and support the retail base and contribute to the creation of a neighborhood with around the clock vital vitality, which is all goals of the Mission Street um, plan. It also calls for encouraging redevelopment and infill development along the Mission Street that will improve the quarter's ep economic vitality, uh, enhance the character of the quarter, and create better pedestrian scale and orientation. Um, so in terms of permits that are being considered tonight as part of this project application, uh, a non-residential demolition authorization permit, a boundary adjustment, design permit, special use permit, water course development permit, and density bonus. So for the non-residential demolition um, permit, um, basically this is for um, for approval of the demolition of the existing stru commercial structures that are currently on the site. Um, the original structures were constructed in 1966 with some later additions in the 70s, um, and the structure has been evaluated, and it was determined that the property is not listed on any historical registries and it's not eligible for listing on the City Historic Building Survey. Um, also, a boundary adjustment is proposed to uh, merge the two existing parcels. Um, the resulting parcel will be approximately um, 0.287 acres, um, 12,500 square feet, which meets the minimum 8,000 square feet um, required for a mixed use project. So um, being located in the CC community commercial, the purpose listed in our zoning ordinance for that district is to provide locations throughout the community for a variety of commercial and services uses for residents of the city and the region which promote the policies of the general plan to encourage a harmonious mixture of a wide variety of commercial and residential. Um, SRO developments um, of 16 or more units and mixed residential and commercial developments with 10 or more above commercial are permitted with approval of a special use permit and design permit in the CC zone district. So both of these are included as, as part of the application. Um, so this, this is a table that goes over some of the CC development standards. Um, the maximum allowed height of building in the CC is three stories and 40 feet. Um, however, as we'll get into the California state density bonus law uh, and city's corresponding density bonus ordinance provide tools to incentivize affordable housing and um, deeper levels of affordability. And one incentive is that the applicants can utilize a waiver um, or modification to development standards if those standards would physically preclude construction of the density bonus project. So. Um, for the subject project, the applicants are proposing a waiver to the district height standard to allow for two additional stories um, with the highest point of the building at approximately 61 feet, and waivers are also being requested for the rear setback and creek setback. Um, the proposed mixed-use project consists of four stories of residential units above ground-level retail and parking with a footprint that covers the majority of the site area. Um, vehicular access to the garage is provided via a driveway access off of, off of Laurel, and the first floor consists of approximately 2,627 square feet of retail at the corner of Mission and Laurel. Um, additionally, there's a residential lobby um, with a mail room, which is accessed from Mission Street. Um, trash enclosure access and utility rooms front off of Laurel, and the trash room layout and interface with the street has been reviewed and approved by our, our Public Works Department. 
Here are a few uh, renderings of the proposed project. This is uh, generally from the, the intersection of Laurel and Mission. Um, this is looking directly across the street, Mission. And this is kind of down the street, Mission looking south. In terms of... Run those just once more slowly, just because there might be people in the audience that haven't seen them. Sure. I've looked at them a lot. And this is kind of looking from the intersection. It's kind of from the, this would be the east. From, from Mission Street. Yeah, across the street, Mission. And this is uh, looking kind of south, like from, from the downtown area, mm -hmm. uh, south. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of building uh, materials, it's kind of it's a contemporary design, incorporating a variety of exterior finishes, um, including uh, textured concrete, metal panels, um, fiber cement panel and stucco, um, patterned metal fences, gates, screens, sunshades, uh, and aluminum uh, windows. Um, residential uses, uh, as I mentioned, will be located on uh, floors two through five. Um, the second floor that's shown here uh, includes a podium terrace, open space with seating and landscaping, uh, as well as an interior amenity room with laundry facilities and storage lockers, which are located um, throughout the project. Um, the proposed 59 um, single room occupancy units are broken down, broken down into 30 um, 288 square foot studios and 29 287 square foot studio units. Um, so, in our zoning ordinance, uh, we have a section that, that regulates single room occupancy units. Um, and so, this table kind of demonstrates how the development meets these standards. So, meeting requirements in regards to um, unit size, um, kitchen facilities, closet facility requirements, um, usable interior and outdoor open space, laundry facilities, storage. Um, and then and management unit and management plan. So um, all of those requirements for single room occupancy uh, is being met. Um, as some of you are probably aware, um, AB 2097, that's assembly bill that was adopted and became in, came into effect on January of last year, um, prohibits uh, local jurisdictions from imposing minimum um, automobile parking requirements on uh, most developments located within a half mile radius of a major transit stop, which is applicable um, to this subject site. So um, though the applicant is not required to provide any parking, they are providing 12 parking spaces at ground level. And um, they're also meeting the um, bike parking requirements, uh, which is 82 class one and 32 class two um, bike spaces. In regards to off-site improvements, um, there'll be a sidewalk expansion um, along Mission Street as well as Laurel Street. Um, also, uh, a bulb out, excuse me, will be um, at the intersection. And all utilities will be undergrounded. Um, there'll be three new street lights um, as well as nine new street trees uh, incorporated into the streetscape. Um, the property abuts um, a section of Laurel Creek Reach 4, which is a, a perennial water course. Um, it's a Category B water course, and these are generally um, creeks that are located in urban areas and that function primarily as, as a drainage system. Um, it includes, um, this category includes water courses with limited riparian habitat um, that is generally confined by adjacent land uses with limited area to expand. So um, pursuant to the citywide creeks and wetlands management plan, <clears throat> the Laurel Creek Reach 4 is a category B, has a 10-foot riparian corridor, a 15-foot setback, development setback, and a 40-foot management area. Um, so a portion of the proposed mixed-use development cantilevers um, above the first floor and would be located within these setback areas and therefore requires a watercourse development permit. Um, as part of that, a biotic review was prepared um, to identify water course setbacks and sensitive biotic resources within the project area and evaluate the proposed project relative to these resources. Um, the report <coughs> identifies this stretch of Laurel Creek 
adjacent to the site as an open channel um, with a mixture of natural and concrete lined side slopes and is comprised of non-native landscaping and non-native forbs and vines. The, the value of the riparian corridor to native wildlife is moderated due to its small size and the lack of native riparian vegetation. Um, and as I mentioned, approximately 68 square feet of, of the building would overhang the riparian corridor, which is about 16 feet above grade. Um, however, this feature will not impact any of the existing riparian woodland vegetation um, per the biotic review. Um, there, the review also indicated there was no special status plant species um, has been recorded for the property and, and there were none observed. Um, <clears throat> also part of the biotic review were recommendations measures to protect the creek. Um, we've included these as conditions of approval and some of these um, conditions and recommendations include implementing riparian restoration and enhancement, so removing invasive uh, non-native plant species um, utilizing. I'm sorry to interrupt, I should yeah. just tell everyone what just happened. Mike's a high school teacher, he was at back to school night and came running down, <laughs> but since he wasn't here for the whole hearing, he can't vote, because you know we all need to have the same information to make a fair decision, so I was just letting him know. Yeah, that. I, um, is that right? I, it is generally right, you need to rehabilitate yourself, although um, I think where we're at in the hearing right now is uh, Ryan's basically given a, you know, a report oh. of what's in the staff report, we haven't <laughs> Started the the public deliberation she, she yet? So. Sorry, Eric. That's okay. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> For future reference. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you hear us? The texts are flying before the meeting. Everybody. All right. Um, anyway, yeah. So, as conditions of approval, there are several uh, creek restoration um, conditions of approval that have been included, including. Uh, planting local native plant species, um, prohibiting lighting, prohibiting mowing and removal of our parent vegetation, and then incorporating BMPs to protect the creek during uh, any construction. Let's see. So in regards to density bonus, um, the applicant has provided plans for a base project that meets all of the CC development standards including height, setbacks, open space, et cetera, and determined the base density uh, to be 40 units. So the developer is entitled to a 50% density bonus, or 60 units. Um, they're proposing 59, so they're within the 60 units that it would be allowed um, with the base, with, uh, on the base density. Um, pursuant to the zoning code for SRO developments, 20% of the single room occupancy occupancy units shall be made available for rent to very low income households at an affordable rent. So with the base density of 40, um, eight or 20% of the residential units will be required to be provided as affordable housing units at the very low income level, which is 50% uh, um, AMI. Um, in addition to allowing more market rate units to offset the cost of providing affordable units, is kind of the point of the density bonus is um, the law also provides a variety of tools um, that applicants can utilize to make projects physically um, or more economically feasible, including waivers from development standards as needed if, if the development standard would preclude the density bonus project from being built at the allowed density. Um, the city must grant these waivers unless they violate state or federal law, um, create a specific adverse impact on health and safety or the physical environment that cannot be mitigated or adversely impact a historic resource. So um, staff has found no evidence that the waivers requested should, should not be granted as required by state law. Um, the applicant has requested three waivers. Um, they're listed here, as I mentioned, the exceeding height, um, FAR, and then um, the setbacks along the rear setback and then the creek setback. So the applicant has requested these three waivers of development standards, all of which are required to be waived if they preclude um, the project development, um, meeting the established development standards, would reduce the volume of the building and eliminate a substantial number of residential units, physically precluding the construction of the projects that would include the number of residential units allowed under the state density bonus law. Um, consistent with our our community outreach policy for planning projects, the applicants 
held an online webinar uh, for the community to learn about the project, ask questions, and give input. It was held on April 18th. Um, there were approximately 100 members of the public that attended with questions and discussions. Discussion items involving everything from height, um, parking, traffic, shading, trash pickup, and pedestrian friendly improvements. Um, there were also comments regarding um, supporting the project in terms of high density housing along Mission Street, which is, is desired, and, and the provision of affordable income units. So uh, in addition to the webinar, a project web page was created and, and posted to the City of Santa Cruz website um, that provides a link to the recorded webinar and allowed for members of the public to submit comments. Um, CEQA provides several categorical exemptions, um, which are applicable to categories of projects and activities that the um, the city has determined generally do not pose a risk of sig significant impact on the environment. Um, so this project has been determined to be exempt from CEQA um, under Section 15.332 for infill development projects. So um, development will implement the city's vision for the west side zone area as expressed by the general plan and the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. Uh, additionally, with a request for a density bonus, project will maximize density while providing 20% of the base density units at the very low income level, which will be a significant addition to the city's affordable housing stock. And with that, the staff is recommending that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and recommend approval of the uh, project based on the, uh, the permits that are listed here, um, based on the findings and conditions that were included as part of the staff report. So I'm available for any questions you might have. All right, uh, Excuse me, Chair. I, I just want to add a couple things. If that's yeah. Okay. Um, one, I'd like to note that um, since the time that this project was locked in um, under SB 330, the elimination of on-site parking was actually already adopted and codified into our local ordinance. So um, the intent of that was to encourage a diverse type of housing options. And... Um, uh, create a more inclusive and equitable community. So although this one was locked in and is utilizing the state law, which supersedes, since that time we have that in our local ordinance. So we're already mov moving towards that goal. Um, also wanted to remind you that under the Housing Accountability Act, the city can't deny a housing project or reduce its density FAR or unit count if the project is consistent with the objective standards that were in effect at the time that the project was deemed complete unless the city makes written findings that the project would have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety. And at this point, we don't have any evidence to support that there are, that there are those impacts. Okay. So I see a lot of uh, faces I haven't seen out here. So like as a hypothetical, if we wanted to make this a two-story project, what could we do that? I'm sorry, what was that? If we wanted to like reduce, if we all agreed to reduce this to a two-story project, are we allowed to do that? Because my impression is no. No, yes. I just wanted to that's have that correct. conversation. Yes, that's correct. Like Under the Housing Accountability are. Act, the city cannot reduce the density of a project if it complies with all of the objective standards. Mr. Dawson? Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask a couple questions that'll help um, inform both us and the audience tonight. So, um, we talked about that this project asks for a density bonus, and we talked about waivers. So is there any limit to the amount of waivers they can ask for? In this case, they've asked for three. Um, can they ask for as many as they want? Yeah, there's no limit to waivers. Our limit's to concessions, and, um, but not to waivers, yeah. Okay. And when a, a developer asks for a waiver, um, is there any sort of limit and how much they can exceed the standard uh, that they're asking to be waived. Is, is, it, is it kind of pinned to, you know, like a height standard or whatever? Or when they ask, it's just waived to whatever they need to make the project feasible? Well, as an example, um, for like in this, this particular project with height, so they, they prepared a base density mm -hmm. Plan that basically has the, the, the size of the units and the number of units mm -hmm. within the setbacks and height that are allowed in that CC uh, in terms of the development standards. Mm -hmm. So 
with the with the fifty percent density bonus, basically the waiver is has to be allowed if if it physically precludes you from adding those in this case twenty extra units. So height wise, you're not going to be able to get those twenty extra units, you know, within the three stories. Because this parcel so, is so small, the only way they can put those units correct. on this parcel is to go up. Right. Exactly. Okay. So um, so yeah. Uh, those are all taken into consideration. So basically, the height would have to be, you know, allowed to go up, step backs expanded, basically to accommodate those additional 20 density bonus units. And I just want to also clarify for the public that when um, the density bonus is calculated on the base number of units, so on the base number of units, they calculated it for 40, is that correct? And 20% of 40 is 8. And then they get to add the additional units, but they don't have to add additional affordable housing. That calculation is only for the base units. Is that correct? Correct. That's based on the law. My understanding is that. Right. So that means functionally. That 20% that only on the base units. So functionally, this project has 13.3% affordable housing. And that's compliant with the law. I would agree with that. But. <laughs> But yeah, if you wanted to look at that way, okay. you could look at it that way, I suppose. Great, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so with regards to calculating the base density and how many units, how is that calculated in like, such, in like a project like this? How do we get to 40 as the base number? Basically, they take what the, the setback and height requirements are for the underlying zoning district. So that gives you a volume. Right, yeah. And then they basically would take the number of units. And this is something I think that, you know, depending on the project, I mean, we've had other projects where they're not single room occupancy, they're larger, you know, two bedroom, three bedroom, larger. But basically, you take, you have to basically take whatever they're proposing in terms of the unit sizes and then. Which is, accommodate case, accommodate like the same right? unit size for those additional fifty percent, essentially. Right. Yeah. And when you're you when you're calculating that, the the volume are we in, we're including the the commercial space in that? Yes. Intra okay. That's it. I don't know if it's possible to put it up. This is on uh, page GP zero point zero five, and at least for me, like seeing it visually, it kind of helps me. Understand it, yeah, on the plan set. So if you have it on your screen, <coughs> sure. yeah, yeah. No, I was just wondering as far as the, the, the commercial that. space being utilized to figure out the base number of residential units. Looks to me like it, it stays kind of the same on the ground floor. All right, other questions from commissioners? Condition number eight specifies that building plans need to be internally consistent. Is there any explicit requirement that these design documents have the same internal consistency? Sorry, I was bringing this up, so I didn't quite hear all of it. So I'll just, I'll just uh, cut to the chase what I'm yeah. thinking about. Um, there's a, a ground floor plan on GP0.05. Mm -hmm that shows one layout for the commercial space, the uh, utility spaces, et cetera, and that does not match the layout that's shown on AP 1.01. .01. Some of the calculations, I think, are based on this layout that we're seeing now, but I'm not sure that uh, it doesn't match the sort of more detailed plans that come later in the set. I just want to make sure there's no ramification I don't believe Emerging so. I mean, because really, that. what we're mainly looking at—I mean, the first floor essentially is all non-residential. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So, what we're really looking in terms of density bonus is the units and the residential units and the volume of those. Okay. Yeah. And and there's no there's no impact on any of the other site planning or access to the building or anything based on that those square footages. No, it's yeah, it's it's. The first, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I think you, you're referring to that first floor mm -hmm. floor plan's a little different than it shows, it shows significantly more commercial space and a little less parking. The other plan that is in the yeah. detailed plan set 
chose less commercial space. I don't think from parking. a density bonus standpoint, I don't law standpoint, I don't think that's going to come into play. I mean, I think in terms of density bonus, the 50% is mm -hmm. really related mostly to the residential component, component right. of the project. Yeah. And I'll mention that the uh, applicant is here and has a presentation as well, so Come they may answer so. some of that. That presentation may answer some of your questions too. Okay. Yeah, Jewel. Yeah, I, I may have some more questions after the applicant's um, presentation, but um, could you point out to me um, there is disabled parking. I know if you provide parking um, under under these state rules where you don't have to. You, um, but if you do, a certain percentage of it has to be disabled parking. And isn't there also a requirement that's for some EV? Or did I mix that yes, up Yes, there is. In fact, they're mm -hmm. indicating EV for all of these here. So these are all EV. And there is, in our zoning code, there is a minimum percentage of EV. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I believe they, they do meet that. Okay. Um, and then I asked this question about um, every project that we get like this, but um, um, in particular, because it's my neighborhood too, um, I'd like to ask about deliveries. Um, and so there, this is also a commercial space, of course, it's very active, but every time we see one of these taller, denser projects with less parking than we're used to, um, I always wonder about the Amazon driver um, and or, or or whoever it is. and, I'm, and how, is, has that been considered of how that would work? The applicant might be able to answer that okay. better than I can. But okay. um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, and, sh and they can speak to it, but I believe that there are kind of two ways. One is the, for a, a truck or a van to be able to pull in to the parking area and load. Um, and then also um, along Laurel, you might the way it happens pull in temp you know, temporarily just to unload some product, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. A good question since I'm parking, I was thinking about EVs too. So just for, are, is the parking count is determined solely, it, it, it's just, they're just volunteering parking, so there's no required parking? Based that's, on AB 2097, that. there's zero. no okay. parking. We, the city cannot, based on state law, require them to provide parking. Okay. So ADA and EV, strangely in this case, is voluntarily for the parking spots. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, Mike. I guess I would also just add, to piggyback on that. Um, prior to AB 2097 taking effect, our climate action plan actually had policies that seeks to reduce and eliminate parking. And then I'll also add that in our housing element, um, there's a policy that seeks to eliminate parking minimums by, I, I believe it's 2028. So. Um, it's not just the state, it's also a direction that the city's headed even before the state came down with their legislation on that. I think it's great and it should be determined by the needs of the use. That's my personal opinion. Uh, Mike, questions? Thank you. Um, I was advised just to take a moment to tell the public, sorry I'm late. Um, I did read the staff report a couple times, just so you know, and I'm prepared to uh, to look at this project tonight. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I just wanted to clarify it before we move forward. So the citywide, and this has to just do with variances versus waivers, right? With the, um, the citywide creeks and wetlands management plan. So under that plan, normally we would require a water course variance, but since there's a density bonus in this project, I, which I assume is under state law, the development is entitled to essentially unlimited waivers to incorporate those units as proposed, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, essentially the thought process was that they could either, I mean, essentially the, the water course variance and a waiver are an equivalent, essentially. Okay. And that was one of the reasons why we also said, well, let's do a biotic, let's do an intense, you know, let's do an biotic review which we would do as part of a water course variance request as well. So basically, it kind of followed the same exact process as we would a, a water course variance. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just curious about that process and whether, uh, in my mind, they were fairly equivalent, but I wanted to see if there was some difference there. Yeah, the, so, the findings you. are slightly different. They're, they're different. I mean, for, um, for the uh, 
waiver, um, you need to show that the, the underlying development standards physically preclude the project from being built with the density bonus units. With the variance, there's other findings that are also enumerated in state law, such as uh, the fact that there needs to be a physical special circumstance associated with the lot that necessitates the variance and that you're not getting any special privileges. So little different findings, but either way, um, it, we can get to the same end result. Correct. Okay, thank you. So I've got two more questions. Uh, I remember when the Mission Street plan was made, it's kind of cool. It's pretty Santa Cruz. It's funky, in my opinion. Um, I know there's been some conflicts with Caltrans, like, over the last 30 years building it out. So could you just describe, like, in terms of street trees or driveways, how, how that, moving forward, like, you guys do a design, submit to Caltrans, they say you can or can't do this. Is that how it works, or...? Have you been through that? Well, just in terms of this particular project, I know that you know standard process is when an application is uh, submitted, it gets distributed to the various city departments. Mm -hmm. So public works being obviously one of them, um, fire, building, etc. Um, so public works um, coordinates usually. They, well, they did. They they coordinated with Caltrans in this mm -hmm. particular case had conversations with them about the proposed improvements along Highway 1 and Mission Street. And, uh, and uh, we, we did receive um, um, correspondence from Caltrans saying that they were, they were good with what's being proposed. Oh, cool. OK. Um, that's good that that communication has happened. Um, thanks for saying that explicitly. My second question is just regarding lighting. And this is always sensitive, like along corridors and neighborhoods. Um, I live in just a block off mission, so I feel it. But I see two great conditions in there, 15 and 16, and maybe we'd be ready to put those up later on. But could you just, just like give me your feeling about how this is going with projects or projects? I, I mean, I know ones downtown have had these conditions, and I love these words, and I see some buildings with really good lighting, but. You know, what's your professional opinion on how, how these uh, conditions are working? I mean, just my personal experience, I mean, I, I haven't received many complaints from people about newer projects and lighting being a nuisance or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been a common occurrence, okay. so. I, I'm not, not expecting you to know only thing I can speak to, but yeah, yeah, there's conditions of, standard conditions of approval usually have to do with lighting being shielded and, and not shining out. Mm -hmm. Being a nuisance to the neighboring properties, and basically the whole point of lighting is for safety, for pathways, and, and yeah, yeah, parking, and all those kinds of things. So, okay, thanks for answering that. That's a bit of a, a hard ball. Um, okay, well, I'll talk more about that later. So that's all my questions. Other questions for staff? Or all right. So next we hear a presentation from the applicants. Welcome. Come on up. And just so everyone knows the process, we'll hear from the applicants, have a few more questions from us, then we'll open the public hearing uh, and hear from all of you. So uh, stick with us. Brian, we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes. What? We don't need 20. I don't, need? I, I don't think we need 20. Ryan's covered a lot of it. And we'll talk you got quickly, 20. but you succinctly. Got if you need it. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, and thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Jamili Cannon. I'm one of the founders and co-owners of Workbench. We're really excited to present this project to the community and to the commission. For those of you who don't know us, Workbench is a local design, development, and building firm. We're based in Santa Cruz, and we are passionate about working to provide housing and meaningful community spaces for our neighbors. Um, Ryan, I think you can go for forward a couple slides. A couple? Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, almost two years ago, Doug and Peggy, the owners of the food bin and herb room, came to us with a request to thoughtfully develop their parcel with residences and to breathe new life into the beloved stores. The project you're seeing tonight is a result of the work that we have all done together over these last two years. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Doug Wallace, the owner of the food bin and the project developer. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Wallace. Um, just that comment about the parking, most vendors come in a small van, pull in the parking lot, they dump off product, and they drive away. We get about one semi-truck a day, maybe, and they park on Laurel Street. 
And then um, once in a while, you get the guys from San Francisco on the park on Mission Street, unload a pallet or two, and then they're gone. That usually happens before 8 a.m. So that's pretty, um, doesn't obstruct anything typically. They're pretty good at getting in and out. So um, anyway, thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, this is uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here, too. These are a lot of customers from the store, and I know a lot of people who have a lot of energy about the product, uh, about the project. And um, so it's um, glad everybody can be in the room together and talk about it and hear about it. And uh, yeah, so I'll just kick it off. So um, I've been in Santa Cruz for 55 years, went to France for elementary, and I'm, I'm vested in Santa Cruz. I love Santa Cruz, and um, I want to do the right thing for the town and, um, and be a part of it for a long time. <laughs> Um, so we purchased the food bin in the herb room, pretty much a, a dying business, really, about five years ago, and a beloved business, though, for the community. And we um, took it on as from the old owner, who basically was just handing it to us, including the property. We, we paid for it, but he really wanted to get rid of it and uh, was having problems with it. And so we invested a lot of time energy, labor, fixtures, equipment, paint, you know, site, you know, trying to fix it up and put put some uh, breathe, breathe new life into it, invest in labor so that people could come in and have a good experience um, and that we could actually be a competitor in town with, you know, an option for New Leaf, an option for TJ's, an option for Whole Foods, when back in the day, the food bin had that all themselves and there were no other stores in town. So just think about all the competition we've had over the years um, with the majority of people really hitting New Leaf, TJ's, Costco, and Whole Foods, you know, and shoppers maybe, right? So those are the, the big shops we, we compete against. So um, our idea was like, okay, we worked in it for a couple years, and then uh, I think COVID hit, and we realized, hey, this long term, it's not really a sustainable model for a grocery store. It's not a sustainable facility. The plant and equipment is just 60 plus years old, it was an old gas station, and um, so we need to do something. So we cut our head together and we ended up starting to work with Workbench, and we looked at a bunch of different options on how to, how to do it properly and how to maintain the integrity of the store. Um, and, you know, we landed on this, this project. So we landed on the mixed use where the food bin, the herb room, will be the anchor for the, for the building. And they'll be able to exist, hopefully, for another 50, 40, 50 years. Um, and be buffered a little bit by the residential as well. So that's a little bit of protection for them um, with, with customers with, uh, to make the whole project work, if you will, um, and build it so it's a little safer than going straight out with, with commercial. Um, so really, yeah, we have four, four, three to four goals for the project. The first is really just to redevelop the site in a, in a tasteful way. And, um, and I know, you know, for some people it's, it, it, it is tall, right? It's a, it's a big project, but it's also something that, um, you know, incorporates the current laws. And I think it's, it's part of, to me, it's like an extension of downtown. We're trying to bringing downtown to the to the edge of town, but we're also doing it in a way that people can still walk to it and, and get there. So, um, and, and really develop a long-term home for the stores. That was the, the second part of that. Um, and then the last thing was, uh, in terms of goals, which is main, you know, create a meeting space and a community gathering space. So the herb room's a, kind of a separate gathering space than the food bin, but really create that in this new project so that the residents mingle with the customers, and it becomes still a, um, a meeting and gathering place to, to get information, to find new products, to learn about health and wellness. So that's kind of the foundation, if you will. Um, but the, the initial seed was really, how do we create the long-term home for the stores? So that was, that was the main thing. And really, the, it doubles the size of the stores almost, consider, you know, square foot to square foot, what we have now versus where we're going. And so we can enhance our product mix in, in both stores, be a little more competitive with some of the other stores, um, potentially put a coffee bar in so that we can, you know, maybe have coffee bar and burritos. So 
you know, Mission Street's kind of built for fast food, right? So it's built for grab and go, trying to catch that shopper in their pattern, but also create a little supermarket to appeal to sort of the neighborhood shoppers, if you will, which is the bread and butter of the business is really the, the neighborhood shoppers. And they're the ones who um, are, are very fond of the store. And so it would be a, it'd be a very much an enhancement, but, but hard for people to realize it, it changing. So it's been, you know, I, I talk with a lot of people about it on a daily basis and uh, it's tough. So I, I, I hear them and I try and understand and, and also say, hey, I think it's really going to be nice at the end of the day. So, um, and then housing, housing came in because that helps the whole project work. It helps meets the needs of the city and the community. Um, and you know, there's a there's a house across the street from us next to the old Emily's, and I think there's 16 kids in there. So you've got houses around our neighborhood with loads of kids, and, and hopefully this can take some impact away from the neighborhoods and provide another option for students, young couples, um, not just students and young couples, but maybe small households and, and people who um, will like a, a smaller space. Um, and, and somewhat affordable. So I kind of think of it as almost like an ADU, like an ADU for a couple. Um, so yeah, and then the parking, we have this roughly the same number, maybe one or two less of parking for the store that we have now. And then um, Workbench, they're gonna talk about parking in, in a little bit in terms of some other ideas we have there. And also look at um, encouraging people to ride their bikes and take scooters, and, and we get a lot of that now. We probably get 10 or 12% of people who do that now without any incentives. So maybe we can incent that possibly down the road too. Um, and then the last part is just, yeah, continue to create like a community meeting place. Part of the natural products industry is really learning and uh, community and, and teaching and, and turning people onto products and helping people with health and wellness. And, and, and so really trying to, to be a resource for that. So making a cool new space where we could do that in a much more uh, professional, efficient, uh, just a, a much nicer shop for people, if you will. Um, yeah, and I think uh, the last part is just, you know, we're, we're small business owners and we'll work hard to uh, create a neighborhood market that really, um, you know, synergistic with the town and, and the neighborhood. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Elizabeth Bishop. I'm the creative director at Workbench. So I'm very tall, so <laughs> working so well. Um, I'm a licensed architect as well, and I've been leading the design of the 1130 Mission Project. Um, um, Ryan, could you go ahead? A couple slides, please. Maybe one more. I'm going to talk about the project overview. Ryan's talked about a lot of this already. He did a great job, especially talking about the density diagrams without looking at them. That was impressive. Um, this slide uh, shows some of the things that we're thinking about as we're designing. Uh, Santa Cruz needs smaller units, like single room occupancy units for retirees and students, so families can occupy single family homes where these groups presently reside. Based on data from the National Low Income Housing Coalition for fiscal year 2021, Santa Cruz County has the highest cost burden for a two bedroom rental in California and the third highest in the whole country. So these are having impacts on, on the community in Santa Cruz and it's something we're thinking about as we're designing this project. Um, some of these statistics, 63% of Santa Cruz renters are paying well over 30% of their income towards housing. More supply of rental housing and more affordable units will help with this. The city of Santa Cruz is required by the state to try to create at least 3,736 housing units in the years between 2024 and 2031. 1130 Mission is contributing 59 of these required units. Currently, locals are unable to find small-sized, affordably priced, well-located housing in the city they work in or grew up in. 1130 Mission Street offers right-sized housing at a lower price point, allowing locals to stay local. And students here are unable to find stable housing. According to a 2020 UCSC study, 9% of students are unhoused. And 
This is the project site. Ryan's going to run through this a little bit. Uh, at the corner of Laurel and Mission Street on Highway 1, which is Mission Street. Um, commercial surrounds uh, the, the four corners there. Um, and there's single family neighborhoods abutting uh, across from the creek. Uh, one of the documents that we referenced when we started design was the Mission Street overlay, which is from April uh, 2002. So it's over 20 years old. Um, the vision for the Mission Street corridor in that document, um, Ryan spoke about this a little bit, um, but it's to reestablish Mission Street as a vibrant commercial corridor that recognizes and carefully balances its functions as both state highway and local serving commercial street. The community envisions Mission Street as a main street for the west side, an attractive, pedestrian-friendly shopping district where local residents can fulfill many of their daily shopping needs without having to drive. So this is over 20 years old. Next slide, please. And this is a, a drawing, a quaint hand drawing of um, the food bin in the herb room at the corner of Laurel Mission. Um, in this document, it, it states facade and landscape enhancement concepts are proposed uh, with pedestrian gathering spaces proposed off of Mission Street, but visible from Mission Street to enhance the feeling of the pedestrian environment. And in that drawing, you can see the corner of Mission at Laurel. Um, is dedicated to the pedestrian realm. And parking is uh, imagined as being less visible to enhance pedestrian access to the businesses. So this is uh, the existing site condition currently. Um, it's worth saying it's not the original location of the food bin and herb room. They've moved in the past. Um, they also were in a, a gas station originally. Um, the stores, as Doug was uh, referring or mentioning earlier, are now 50 plus years old and in need of a refresh. Uh, and the site is earmarked for development by the city. And the uh, existing issues with the aging buildings include several earthquakes um, uh, on ground with a very high water table. Um, the site uh, was originally a gas station and the intent was never to be a grocery store or health food store. Uh, remediation work has been completed recently. Um, and they've removed uh, the remediation monitoring. Um, and the stores have energy and efficient exterior walls and roofs, which we're going to address in the new building. Um, and there have been in the past loading issues with trucks stopping at Mission Street. And Doug was mentioning most of the deliveries now are going to be off of Laurel Street. Um, so the food bin and the herb room are staying. Um, they're not going to leave. Uh, you can see we photoshopped the uh, signage on the image on the bottom, the herb room and, and food bin. Um, the newly proposed space is going to be larger than the existing stores, as Doug mentioned. And the current product mix is going to be maintained, along with a grab-and-go uh, coffee bar. Um, and modern equipment will you know, enable efficient customer service. Go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is overall project information. I, th I think we'd probably skip it, Ryan. You did a pretty good job. Um, yeah, this is a good one. So who will live here? Um, and Doug kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, primary market profile is young professional singles under 30 years of age, college students. Um, secondary market would be couples or roommates or older singles looking to downsize. Um, and there's data that shows that people choose to live in um, units the size and scale. Um, for largely economic reasons, um, you know, potential residents interested in spending 20 to 30 percent less than a conventional unit. Um, there's also um, people want to live in the neighborhood and have reduced utility costs, and also people don't want cars; they don't want to have to keep a vehicle. And so, um, there's been a lot of concerns from the community about the creek. Um, so we have been mindful of the creek um, from the outset of the design. Um, we're designing the building in sort of a U-shape to face the creek. Um, and we've got a lot of um, biodiverse habitats. So we're um, placing sort of green roofs um, on native plantings. And, and we're respecting that creek setback and treating the creek as a natural amenity. Yeah. Um, and this is a new slide, actually. We added this recently. Um, so the red on the left diagram shows areas that we could have put building. Um, we've waved out of setbacks, as we were mentioning earlier. Um, but we've actually pulled the building away from the property line on the left um, to give the neighbors some room there and to lessen the impact of the building's bulk. On um, There's some comments from the community about shading the building and shading the PV. So we've moved the building over a bit to um, give them a bit more light. 
Um, also, uh, like the images on the right, uh, you could see, um, as Ryan was mentioning, we're going in with 59 units. We're allowed to have 60, but we've removed that corner unit um, to reduce the bulk of the building. So from the corner of Mission and Laurel Street, you can see on the right, it does look significantly less massive uh, because we're stepping the upper level back and we've removed that unit. Yeah, and we've been asking, how can we be a good neighbor? Provide housing that's more affordable for people within the community, encouraging biodiversity on the site, um, building a connection between the commercial space and passers-by through sight, sound, and material, really featuring that herb room and food bin at the corner, improving that pedestrian experience that we were talking about earlier, um, visible from Mission Street, bringing natural light and greenery to the base of the building with built-in planters and nine street trees. And we're bringing the food bin back, so reinstating the small local business on the site. Um, and we're actively encouraging residents to adopt a car-free lifestyle. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jamili to talk about traffic and parking. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next slide, Ryan. So some proposed parking information. I think we've covered some of this, but I know parking is a big concern for everybody here tonight, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, we are aiming for a car-free community in this building. Uh, we are prioritizing, Doug and Peggy, are prioritizing renting to residents without cars. Um, and utilizing that state bill allows us to prioritize housing people over parking cars. Uh, the proposed parking is for the food bin only during operating hours, and with potentially managing the parking in a way that guests to the building could park when the food bin is closed, say 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, there's currently a permit, a parking permit strategy in place. This is what, what the owners do right now for their employees. Uh, so there's parking permits that allow the employees to park in the neighborhood, but those would not be available to uh, residents of 1130 Mission. They could be deemed ineligible for parking permits in the adjacent neighborhood. Um, Doug mentioned this, they're considering doing additional promoting, you know, 10% off if you bike on Tuesdays kind of a thing. Um, and then we heard a lot of feedback about parking in the community meetings. So we did, uh, we did a bunch of rework on the ground floor and we were able to um, up the parking from six regular parking stalls to 10 and with two accessible parking stalls. So there's a total of 12 and previously we had eight. Um, all of the parking spots are EV. The, it's a mislabel on the drawings, but I do think that everybody was clear on that in the packet. Uh, next slide, Ryan. Um, we've talked about this, so access to the building is off of Laurel. Uh, parking, trash, recycling, loading, all of that will be in the building where possible or in the yellow uh, or the white loading zone off of Laurel with uh, that, that kind of um, activity off of Mission Street. Next slide. Um, Mitigating traffic and parking impact, again, just promoting alternative modes of transportation and car-free living. Um, we are also looking at promoting sustainable travel, so we can do that with transit subsidies, bike share subsidies, um, bike repair services on site, and the residential parking permit exclusions that we talked about before. Um, there are, I think there's actually 80, um, 82 or 83 class one bike storage spaces within the building. So that's a that purple box inside the building. That's for residents, it's locked. Um, and then on the outside of the building, there's 36 class two bike storage spaces. Um, Santa Cruz and this, this location in particular is considered a biker's paradise. We get a bike score of 100 out of 100. Um, all daily errands can be accomplished on a bike. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I think most people in the room are familiar with the location, really easy biking distance to state parks, UCSC, downtown, and beaches. Um, we can move on, next slide. Um, you, it's a very walkable location, it gets a walk score of 89, so you can walk to all of these services within a quarter of a mile. Uh, retail, pharmacies, restaurants, medical, dental offices, three schools, and city parks and trails. Next slide. Um, a little bit more about those strategies for reducing parking and traffic impacts. Uh, so the transit subsidies and the bus routes, the Metro pro Metro has a program uh, that'll, that partners with housing developments to make subsidized transit passes for all residents really easy. There's three bus stops within a quarter mile of the site. The uh, Bay and Mission UCSC bus stop is within a half a mile and there's five bus routes that serve those bus stops. Next slide, Ryan. Um, so 
we really feel at Workbench that more parking equals more traffic equals more impact. Less parking means less cars, which is less traffic and less impact. Um, and in the interest of time, I don't know if we want to do the next slides or not. Yeah, Ryan, I think you've already talked through most of the site plans, but if you want to skip all the site plans, um, yeah, site plans and floor plans we can pass. And then there's a little bit about the exterior design that we can really quickly go through. So um, the exterior design, we took inspiration from the natural landscape of Santa Cruz. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see the color palette is kind of referencing those warm browns and the kind of natural tones. It might be the um, mic. I get it all the time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Feels a little uncomfortable. Okay. Um, yeah, so we were looking at the natural landscape of Santa Cruz for inspiration. Um, and Peggy also had this lovely idea about um, the uh, butterfly garden or a wildlife garden on the roof of the project. Uh, so we worked with our biologist and our landscape architect to develop an all native planting palette. Um, there has been a lot of concern about the creek and what gets planted there. Um, in the biotic report, but currently, um, I think there's only three to four inches of water in the creek. It's a concrete channel. Um, in terms of native species, and Ryan mentioned this, there's nothing of significance. Um, there is one tree in the, in the creek area that we're removing. Uh, it's an ash, so not a native, not a native species. Um, and the biologist has recommended that we go back in with native species um, and replant some of the, the area. We're going to be removing it's bamboo, ivy, other um, invasive species, and, and replanting with native species. Um, and uh, we've got container gardens, uh, so that's level two on the podium, um, with built-in seating, and those are all native plantings as well. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then this is the butterfly garden on the roof. Um, so our, our biologist has reviewed our landscape drawings as recommended um, some removal of certain plants. There is concern from the community um, about monarchs, um, and so we've removed all the milkweed. There's no milkweed. It's not, we're not intending to attract monarchs to the project, um, but there are other butterflies, other pollinators. Um, and the idea is to bring that creek, um, you can see from this image actually, the, um, leaving a lot of the greenery from the creek and bring that into the building, so supporting the the species that are there, um, and encouraging more native species um, with native plantings. Um, and, uh, yeah, this image is from Mission Street, and you can see the um, residential entrance on the far right and the entrance to the food bin on the left. And we get some self-shading um, from the um, like sawtooth facade. Um, so the idea is to reduce uh, the solar heat gain um, with the, the self-shading. Um, it's an all-electric building, um, and we've got PV on the roof as well. You can see we've added a lot of greenery. Ryan was mentioning the, the street trees, and we've got planters built in, um, and even a little area at the bottom for bins of produce, um, which the project um, retail takes its name from the food bin. All right, thank you for that. Um, any further questions from commissioners for the applicant? Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, I just, um, could you clarify about the bus passes? So is so are bus passes going to be available to all residents? And if so, for how long? Or do you talk a little bit more about that? I don't know a lot about the Metro program, but I know that there is a program through Santa Cruz Metro that allows us to work closely with them and provide uh, bus passes for residents. I, Doug, do you know more about it? Anyone else? <laughs> Sorry, Commissioner Dawson, I don't have a lot of information about it, but the idea would be that it's available to residents. It's something that's either subsidized or part of the rent package. It wouldn't be something that you get for six months and then gets taken away. So it's um, would you something be available. open to a condition that says that you would work with Metro to, you know, move that pro program forward? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I've got a 
few other questions? Go. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just had a quick question. I thought I heard you say something about um, like a lunch situation or like a hot bar. Did I hear that right? Grab and go. Grab and go. Because, and I'll just tell you why I'm I'm bringing this up. I, sure. I'm thinking not only about you know residents uh, supporting the herb room, but also um, its proximity to Santa Cruz High School as a lunch spot for Santa Cruz High right. kids. That's going to be a thing once that gets out. So I'm just curious <laughs> about um, what you what your thoughts were there. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we It's funny because we have that now. We have some students who wander into the food bin for lunch, but none of them really buy anything. They buy like a drink. That's it. That's their lunch usually. But they do go to La, they go to La ha down the street. <clears throat> they used to go to Emily's. And so the idea there is we could have a healthy burrito or a healthy sandwich or something that would attract the students as well, especially now that Emily's is closed and is moving into another type of business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then on this same ticket, I'm not sure this is a this is probably more of a question for staff. So, um, given that uh, Mission Street is technically a state highway, right? Do we have any sort of leverage about the crosswalk situation going on there? Or is that more of like a Caltrans issue? Again, uh, Curtis Busenhart in, in the Public Works Department, I know that he he had conversations and met with um, representatives of Caltrans. So certainly anything that we'd want to propose, we probably you know want to run by them if it's going to be different than what is currently being proposed. But yeah, I mean, I know Caltrans can have some pretty strict mm -hmm. requirements along their highway, so... Um, were you thinking of, of uh, a revision or a change or addition or something? Well, in, in my mind, you know, Mission Street is not uh, uh, the safest road in the city. And um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know how out of bounds uh, crosswalk improvements would be, you know, or what the process would be there. Um, it's not the most dangerous intersection that there is, but it's... No, it's not great either. I'm sure we could probably craft, if you had an idea of a condition, we could craft it with some type of caveat that, you know, if you reviewed and approved by Caltrans or something to that effect, if you had certain details, ideas about the sidewalk or the uh, crosswalk or. Well, it's, it's muddy waters for me because I don't want to put a condition on the project that makes it take longer and that we have to run by Caltrans and do all these things. But at the same time, if there's a simple um, evaluation that can be done to make sure that, you know, that kids can get to the herb room, if it's going to be a more popular place, then that is something that I would like to explore at the very least. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to get a sense of what that might look like, like, you know, little flashing lights in the crosswalk, right? Or, uh, you know, I don't even know what you call them, but you push the buttons and it says walk, don't walk, right? Or, you know, things like that. I don't want to... It already. What's that? It already has that. Oh, it does. Okay. Well done. Mm -hmm. We're good. <laughs> and it's been going okay. They have that red light one down yeah. by, I still call it long, CVS. That's like Caltrans being like positive and supporting the city, I think. Uh, just a couple of questions. I don't think we can comment on aesthetics, so I'm probably just as well, but I, I wanted to talk about some logistical things. Um, you mentioned, the, the, the applicant mentioned the uh, articulated vehicles, uh, semis, that come to the site currently. Do they currently loop through the lot? When they, you're saying they unload on Laurel, oh, and, and then what do they, where do they go from there? The, do they go up through the neighborhood, yeah. or do they? The, so most of them are like the Ford Econo van, the smaller ones with the, you know, they pull in. Yeah. Usually okay. they back up in the lot and pull out on Laurel just because mm -hmm. it's easier getting off of Laurel than going into Mission. Yep. The semis, the only thing the semis do is they'll back into the lot. What? Now, well, uh, hold excuse on. me. Hold Can on. you guys uh, please be quiet right now? Thank you. They'll back into the lot. The ones that know how to do it back in and drop it off because it's right there. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of them park on Laurel Street, yep. dump the pallet there, and then, you know, hand truck it all the way over to the receiving area. Right. And then the really, like, San Francisco-type drivers, 
the stop on Mission Street and block the slow lane. Okay. Drop the pallet, bring it in, but it's only about 10 minutes, you know, so it's early in the morning. But how, how do the people that simply park on Laurel, you're saying some of them back out and then yeah. come back down yeah. Laurel, if... Do they come up through the neighborhood when that doesn't happen? Is there any other option for them? I I'm think just looking some at the do fact come. Yeah, I think <clears throat> some come from King maybe down Laurel. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're supposed to go. Most of them know they're not supposed to go that way, but some that don't know come that way just because it's an easier right. They can exit. stop and then mm -hmm. exit. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I was just. I like that you have provided a space, a la Commissioner Conway's comment about the. UPS driver, there is a place where they can pull in and come out, head out, and just go back to mission. <laughs> Even, I think, with the height of the lower floor, there's probably space for a small box truck. Yeah. Uh, it would be tight, but it's I think it's possible. But I am a little bit concerned about uh, articulated trailers and, and larger mm -hmm. trucks. Um, how much, you said that's maybe once? Yeah, with the <clears throat> so we probably get on average of every day we get one pallet from one semi. Mm -hmm. On two days of the week, we get two semis. Okay. And this, when we have two semis on those two days, we get, you know, that's our big day. So we might get a pallet from the one and maybe two or three pallets max from the other one. So they're pretty quick unloads and loads. Sometimes a guy will pull in our parking lot, <clears throat> shuffle his load around, and he's in a smaller truck, and he goes to UCSC so he can get, you know, a smaller truck in there. Right. And, and, you know, I'm not, uh, I support the concept of the project. I, they're just these logistical yeah. things that I think yeah. are real impacts on the neighborhood. And I'd like to see if there's some way that we could shape that instead of it, mm -hmm. you know, being, I realize that the San Francisco guys, or yeah. whatever, they are going to do what they do. But um, I, I do think those are real impacts. Um, and we don't really manage them around that right now. We kind of let them do what they do. We, you know, we talk to the drivers. Hey, this, you know, and that's kind of what I'm getting at, though. It's yeah. just if it if it is if there are some prescriptions that we could talk mm -hmm. about, that would be very useful. Similarly, the waste uh, collection and and loading on garbage days. I'm I'm presuming these things you've gone through with Public Works. Um, is it still the case that you're thinking of staging them in the entrance to the parking? Um, what we do now is we just move recycling, green waste, sure. everything to the street. Yep. But the, the recycling of hard cardboard and garbage, he backs right in, gets it, and he goes right out. Right. And I think but that'll the, probably the drawings, be how. It seems to indicate that they're, they're pulled out of the room and staged in front of the gate that exits the parking. And is that the intention or? You mean now? You On the know. drawings. Mm -hmm. Proposed. Oh. Yeah, that's, I, I think it's, <coughs> I'm not sure, it's the, it's the more detail, there, no, yeah, that's it. So in the entrance to the driveway behind right. the gate, it looks like they're being staged for pickup. <coughs> talking to, to Curtis um, mm -hmm. Bussenard about it, and this is, so you can see where the trash um, room is. Yes. It's being shared between the commercial space and also the trash chutes coming down from above. Yes. So the idea is those are pulled out and staged there at the at that sort of dashed area. So, the so that the, the the garbage chutes are why the bins are not on the exterior. Yeah. Or yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're trying to share. Yeah. We're trying to maximize um, our footprint, um, maximize the commercial space. So by sharing that trash and recycle room between the commercial space and the um, residences above, um, we can get an extra parking space in there. No, I get that. I'm, I mean, to me, and this is, I'm not trying to redesign the project, but it seems the, with the way that the ordinance is written for trash collection, the ideal thing is they want a, a an enclosure of a certain size. It has drainage, et cetera, et cetera. But then they want the opportunity to be able to either stab the big, uh, the big containers and lift them into the truck, um, which might be possible if, yeah, the, if this it is was what on we're the doing. Um, yeah, so we've Curtis said this same thing, and so we've got clearance at the ground level to do yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's great. I'm just saying that it seems like staging those bins at the entrance to the driveway when you're proposing to let people park there overnight is problematic. That's you know. Yeah, they go on. The, maybe they'd be on the street. 
No, yeah, I, so they're not. I, we, uh, my office, we have a similar situation, but they actually come in and wheel out the bins from an area that's yeah, off the it, sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, Curtis didn't, did. didn't want but to. But Curtis, that. I know, yeah. Public Works does not want the that. The building model. management will, will do yeah. it rather than. Well, like I say, it's, it's, I, I think those are real impacts yeah. that could be. We can look at it as, uh, so as we go into the next stages of design, we can certainly look at it. We want the electrical room um, on the exterior for PG&E, so um, that's important. But yeah, we can certainly take a look mm -hmm. at that, shuffle those things around. And obviously working with Curtis um, in Public Works is going to be an important part of that. And, and yeah, I know that Curtis said. Put in, John, yeah. I believe there's a condition that requires like a operations plan. Does that apply in this case? Like to be submitted later for that? I've seen those conditions yeah. before. I didn't yeah. see it in this oh, okay. set, but. I didn't check for that one. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. I know that you could add it. they have mm -hmm. worked with Curtis on this quite a bit and discussed different options. And yep. while, as you mentioned, it's not completely ideal, um, Curtis, um, through their discussions, determined that this would this would be acceptable. I was actually thinking about safety, just, you know, hemming people in. Yeah, with those you know those bins being there. That's all. Um, similarly, there was one other issue that I wanted to ask about, and there is some space that is uh, provided across the sidewalk and that little bit of common area that's between the property line and the front and the gate that enters the building. These are all going to be automatic automatic gates, or how 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 I, maybe that's part of the operations plan too. But the person that's coming to the gate is that just always open during business hours, or is it is it controlled at night? Is it uh, because vehicles need places to pull out while they're waiting for it to open? That kind of thing. So one of the things um, Sam and Ryan asked for was um, the draft SRO management narrative, mm -hmm. um, and so I think what you're asking about was covered under security, um, which is TBD. We're still working okay. through it. And as the project progresses, um, we'll understand more and develop it more. Um, but it is expected that the project will design and install a security camera and monitoring system covering the ground floor and parking areas. Card, fob, key, or other secure means of access will be provided to the tenant entrance as well as to the secure bike bicycle parking area on the sites. So there's. There's a lot of work to be done on that, but we're imagining that, that's that fine. I, I'm just that I think, you know, a lot of public works departments, they want a complete pullout area for a vehicle that's waiting for a gate to open. And so I, I just like to make sure that those things are addressed as the project goes forward in more detailed development. Yes, we'll do Thanks. that. Thank you. All right, well, I've got uh, Three more questions for the applicant, uh, maybe mainly the workbench team, but whoever. Um, you said it's an all electric building. Technically, you could come back and do a gas building right now. Don't tell anyone. But are you committed to all electric, uh, to, no matter what the the laws say at this point? Yes, we so are. Um, you don't want to waste the extra money on the fossil infrastructure. Awesome. No, and it's a key value of workbench. Sustainability is quite important to us. I thought so. I just wanted to say in public one more time, uh, just in case. Um, so I have two more detailed questions. The first is kind of, um, I touched on it earlier, involving light trespass. And I see this personally. I like modern buildings. And I think it's cool. And the whole front of it to me is like, light this baby up light that orange V up, make it a sign. Then I think of the neighbors on the back side and the riparian corridor side and say, oh, the opposite. I don't want a single drop of light in this entire facade ever touching that neighbor's house. You know, I want to stand up on the hill and look down on this baby and not see anything, just blackness. So could you speak to what's already happening there and how we can help make sure that uh, the building is lit for retail in a cool way, but not trespassing and describe the baseline because it's really high in, in California. Yeah, um, so I think one of our concerns has to do with um, wildlife and light. And so ensuring there's no light trespass is really important because we're right next to the riparian corridor to the creek. Um, so I think Ryan mentioned a little bit before, like all the uplights will be, but well, they won't be any uplighting and all be shielded. Um, light trespass, like no light will go from our building off of the property line. Um, and we have some work to do, um, you know, specifying different Lumieres that achieve that, um, which is doable. 
um, we're looking at um, like the lead requirements um, for light, um, which is, again, there's a whole checklist of things that uh, we'll be taking a look at. Um, the, if you scroll up a little bit so you can see the amenity area on the plan. Um, yeah, that corner, I mean, these are planning drawings, so we'll be okay. developing these significantly as we move forward, but making sure that um, there's not heavily glazed areas that are allowing light trespass from the inside of the building. Outside is going to be something that we're looking at in the design. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't want to cause extra cost. I get this design is coming later. I see photometric plans all the time. Would you be doing one already, or would that be something you'd be open to? Uh, yeah, that's... A great idea, actually. We need to make sure we're getting enough lighting like in the parking areas to meet the requirements of the building code, so uh, photometric study is a great way of... Okay, and to that. pause for the public, a photometric is a special study by the lighting designer of the site where they put each light in and then plot out, you know, like, if you have a tall parking lot light, it's going to put more light out like that. If you have a little low light, it just puts it on the ground, so... It's a pretty good tool to, to have the design team be able to look at that in a very detailed way. Um, okay, I think I'll probably require that. It sounds like you're pretty amenable to it. Um, I do want to get more specific about that one neighbor um, who clearly is bearing the brunt of this project impact-wise. Can we look at that north elevation? What sheet, what sheet is it? I wrote it down here somewhere. EP 4.01. This is planning stage. I think this will come later. Okay. But looking at kind of the bottom floor, are we on the right one? Let me go one more. There it is. Yeah, that's from the, if you're standing, I think that's creek. facing the creek, right? Yeah, exactly. You're, so it's, a, it's a, that it's, is what it's, faces it's, the creek. It's this, this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, that's, that's Laurel Street. You can see the little outline of the ADU um, the neighbor has. Totally. So that's the view that I was looking at earlier. At the ground level, oh, looks, no, looks like a six-foot fence on your side of the property line, not whatever's going on their side. And that's designed to be kind of like a perforated metal screen. Yeah, it's a, which, it's a screen. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I think, but I was like, cool. Then you see beyond that, you'll kind of see into the parking area. And then if you're standing in that neighbor's yard, you're looking up kind of at the ceiling of a podium, which in my experience has tons of emergency lighting everywhere and you know all those things that come. So I wonder, again, this is like compromises, right? We're not gonna make it perfect for this neighbor. I'm sorry, neighbor. But could you describe uh, what you'd be willing to do in the future to kind of talk to them about options? And you know, it seems like if I'm that neighbor and I could have some input into, is that a solid fence or a, brick wall, it might not have a huge cost impact, but it might really mean a lot to that person. So yeah, that's I didn't right. even know I would condition it, but I just wanted to have that conversation. Yeah, great idea. Um, so we had had conversations about um, the fence and the screen and had changed it a couple of times, um, just uh, the, the appearance of it to make it. So right now, before I think it was more opaque and um, right now it's, it has a kind of a reference to like tree branches. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're developing that and, you know, working with the neighbor to, you know, refine something that is suitable. Um, yeah, would totally be possible. Okay. We could cool. also look at, I didn't really actually, frankly, thought about the soffit or the underside of um, sort of level one. And so in doing some studies, maybe um, views of that, just understanding what you would see from if you're standing there looking up um, is something to take a look at. That's why we get the paid the big bucks up here is to bring these things. It's gonna up. be. Uh, I want to point out too that you you mentioned earlier you brought that building back. I forget twelve feet. Fifteen, yeah. Or fifteen, like voluntarily, but that that really helps there. Okay, again, I don't expect to be perfect, but the more of that communication that can happen, the less static we'll have the next big building that comes. Okay, last question, and then we are getting to public comment. Thanks everybody for your patience. Um, this one's fairly detailed too. Can we look at the roof plan real quick? I love modern roofs. There's like so many things going on up there. I see the green roof. Is that part of the stormwater treatment? So we, scroll oh, down. One more down. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, or is it just an amenity space? A lot of times it's used for stormwater. Yeah, no, you can see, um, actually, I think it's 17. Or, yeah, if there's a better one that shows it in color. Uh, there's some downspouts. So there is drainage going off of the roof. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this one has green on it, so it's maybe easier to see, but the 
I, I worked on the That's architecture perfect. one, so I know more what's going on there. Busy um, roof, mechanical equipment screened already, green roof, and then a hangout area on the top roof? Or Yeah. I don't Do you remember. mind going back to the architectural? Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Um, yeah, to the architectural drawing. Of oh, the hangar is one level. Yeah, so right, yeah, the, right, yeah, the landscape architect. But so those two, um, you can kind of see trees at the bottom. Um, those are green roof um, okay. open spaces for the residents. So my question is mechanical equipment. We live in this new world of lots of big things going on on the roof. Less so in Santa Cruz. Less so with unconditioned corridors makes a big difference. We have this condition about visually screening mechanical equipment from the roof, which is fine, okay, great. But I wonder if um, you'd be amenable to us kind of increasing that to maybe study like a more sound blocking solution. And I don't think one heat pump is gonna change our town from a town where I can hear the sea lions, you know, from my porch. But I think the one I put in last year and the one you're putting on top of this building and his and you know any, everyone adding these in, we're gonna get this hum in Santa Cruz. And I'm real nervous about conditioning this because it's costly, but I just wanted to say, could you talk to him, you know, talk to an acoustic person about possibly cost-effective ways of at least on like the neighborhood side screening that. Like one project we had, they used solid plywood and that was all it took, you know, or something like that. So, all right, I'm rambling now, but I'm um, concerned about overall noise. It's way up in the air. These are quiet machines that are well maintained, but often you can pay a few bucks extra for the quieter one. So, just yeah. want to bring that up. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, we have been really sensitive to noise just in in general. It's part of the reason the U of the building is facing the creek, so that um, rather than turning towards Mission Street, because Mission Street is quite loud, so that would be very loud for the residents. So, mm -hmm. um, we've got the mechanical equipment where it is. Um, towards the north because we wanted to increase the light for all the plants and the solar panels. But it, it might be possible to move the me mechanical equipment closer to Mission Street, which is louder. Um, in terms of acoustic attenuation, I think adding mass is usually the way you handle noise. So if plywood would work, um, that's something we could look at. I can see a structural engineer just like cringing about putting that on the roof, but uh, you, you hear me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are my questions. I have yep, one more follow up. Yep. Um, most of my questions have been answered, but um, I did have a couple. And I I love that you brought that up. I'm not crazy about adding conditions that, um, you know, kind of slathering them on, but I love that um, as a point. Um, I think that's really great. My question was because um, I, I, I walk on Mission Street to get there all the time. You're adding width to the sidewalk. I believe that's there, which I think is great. Mission is not that fun to walk on, even though I do it all the time. How much are you adding? Gosh, however much you guys ask for. <laughs> Can you just I'm not sure what's there me, now, but, but uh, along Mission, it's going to be because the, the building kind of. Uh, I could see it kind of. It looks like it's. It's back 10, a 10 to 12 feet is going to be the width along Mission for the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably something more like... And then it's 9 to 11 along Laurel. Okay. And that's not really counting kind of the larger area at the corner, uh -huh. which is kind more of a, open with the bulb out and all that kind of stuff. That's just sign. kind of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, just it, I mean, it kind of looks like it'd be more than twice as wide. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was thinking, yeah, too. Yeah, I was going to guess maybe now. Is it six or seven? That's maybe what at I, the most? I, I, that sounds right. Yeah. It, it's kind of a squeeze. So it's going to be quite... Okay. Quite a bit wider. And no curb cuts on that whole side. That's pretty sweet. That's good. That's what you get when you're not parking everywhere. I love it. Yep. Okay. Okay. I don't need to ask any other So any other questions? I just, one more? I just wanted to clarify something really quick based on what um, Commissioner McKelvey was saying that he could not comment on aesthetics. Um, you certainly can comment on aesthetics. What you can't do is deny the project based on aesthetics, or Absolutely. you know, make the project infeasible based on aesthetics, or um, you know, reduce density. So you know, feel free. The only thing I wanted to comment on is on the facades themselves. There's a. It looks like there are a series of platforms made, and are is this? I've asked this question of other projects. Is is part of the consideration of the way these units are designed 
that they may be modular? Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. that is what we're, we're considering. Um, modular construction it has less of an impact on the community because it goes up faster, and the um, modular fabricator we're talking to you has um, union labor, which has been a concern. Well, let me let me just mention one thing that uh, Commissioner uh, the Commissioner Kennedy brought up, uh, the idea, and that is the treatment of the screens with that high uh, parking area behind, and that is that I'm, you know, just from an aesthetic point of view, the screens I think could be terrific but you're going to be looking up at basically what looks probably like the bottom of a highway overpass, and there are going to be a bunch of big pipes. And they're just going to be, that's what people are going to experience. And that's, it's very urban, and it could be really cool if it's designed really nicely. But if it's just kind of like, you know, we need an 8-inch pipe, you know, put it where it is, or whatever, wherever it needs to be, you know, it could be sublime or... Profane. So, I think that's a good point. It was something that we hadn't studied before, mm -hmm. um, but it is sort of an elevation of the project, if you will, the underside of that, because it is visible, especially from the neighbor's um, view. So, but with studying that, height that in the future. And the clearance between the top of the fence, as it's indicated, and then, you know, the entire underside of that building going all the way back, it's going to be, you know, a lot of concrete and it's going to be dark so all right one last question any <laughs> conditions you really don't like and we should consider dropping think about it you can answer later mm -hmm. I'll ask again all right so if all questions are done we will now open the public hearing I want to set the table real quick. We're all here to participate in an open public process. This is Democracy in Action. It's great. We're all here working to make this a better building. And I want to really encourage everyone. Everyone's been great so far, but just please be, continue to be respectful and hold your comments. Clapping, snickering, yelling stuff out, uh, at least for me, does not help your point. Um, so let me do two quick straw polls. This is just for, for me to get a feeling of how many people want to speak. Um, how many people here want to speak? Okay, great. How many people here love the food bin and herb room and want it to persist? <laughs> All right, cool. That's a separate poll. Um, how many, last question, how many people here in this audience and the commission have lived in an apartment in their life? Okay. Um, so we're going to open public comment. I'm going to put a two-minute limit on public comment. The reason we do that is not to cut you off. It's just to move the meeting along. If someone has said what you said, there's no need to say it again. Um, two minutes is really a long time. Feel free to use it. You don't need to use the full two minutes. It's really important to sign your name in on the paper over here so staff can write it down correctly. And you're not required, but if you can say your name, that is great and uh, really helps. So let's get started. I'm opening the public comment period. Hi, my name's Joel Domhoff. I want to first thank Commissioner Paul Hamus. I, too, am a uh, full-time high school no, teacher, so uh, appreciate what you do in the classroom. I also want to thank Commissioner Dawson for raising that question she did. I hope everyone watching and all of you were paying attention, because as the old saying goes, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. They twisted the numbers. They told you it was 40 and it was going to have X percentage based on that, and then they added it. That, to me, is disingenuous and not cool. Third thing I want to say is... Um, we heard uh, Commissioner Conway ask about deliveries early on. The owner said there were no problems with deliveries. Workbench then got up here and said the problem with the current setup is there are problems with deliveries. So what is it, one or the other? Okay, I've got a couple things written down here. Why are we giving all these waivers? We've already been forced to bend the rules for the state. Why are we giving additional waivers for this type of thing in this neighborhood? Secondly, the riparian quarter argument. They've asked for a waiver on that. What's the point of having the riparian quarter 
parameters in place if they're going to waive them. That goes right into Neary Lagoon. It's Laurel Creek is identified as a legal creek in the city. That shouldn't be allowed. Lastly, the relationship between the nonprofit that's involved in this and Workbench. Why is Sibley Simon a partner in both entities? If he's in a nonprofit world, why is he also involved in the for-profit side of this? I'm just asking, is that a conflict of interest? To me it is, but that's for you all to decide. I, I'm not anti-growth, but I do think these should be built downtown. I say, uh, Commissioner Kennedy, you said, why can't we do two stories? And uh, Ms. Hashert said, you can't say no based on this, that, and the other. I say you can. Guess what? There's plenty of lawyers who would love to say, hey, why don't we build one story on every business on the Mission Street corridor instead of five on top of one? And then lastly, uh, I grew up in this town. I grew up right there. I used to go to Mellis Market. Not there anymore. So my response to that is for Mr. Wallace, the owner, hey, you can do your thing. You can have drive through lunch. Why do you have to have five stories on top? Keep it as it is. Build up your business, survive or or die. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen, resident of 1227 Laurel Street for more than 30 years and a neighbor and loyal customer of the food bin. I am in principle supportive of the development of the property, but strongly believe that the height is incompatible with the character of the neighborhood. Um, Certainly, I mean, as attested here, when Doug and Peggy started to research this project, they did not anticipate building a five-story building. It was not in anybody's plan years ago that this would happen. And so I would ask um, Mr. Kennedy if you would ask the question again, um, could this be built at four stories? You asked two. Could this be built at four stories? And my um, my um, thought is that that would be somewhat mitigating the circumstances of that. And my other question is: Is this a density bonus or a density mandate? So, like, <laughs> do they have any say in this? Do we have any say in this? Do you have any say in this? Could it be a four-story building? Could that help somewhat? Um, regardless of the developers, I believe it's the city that needs to be accountable for going beyond bureaucratic compliance checklists and having the foresight to understand and address the impact their decisions will have. The parking situation will be untenable for the neighborhood and for the food bin in servicing its future customers. We're already a pretty high density neighborhood with multi-generations living in single family homes and many ADUs, which is great. But we are already at capacity on the 1200 block of Laurel with 23 parking spaces for 12 lots. The food bin having at this point five additional neighborhood parking permits for staff and ever increasing commercial customer parking demands with a food bin copal, real taco truck and soon a cannabis dispensary. Adding 59, thank you. Finish your thought, please. Adding 59 um, residences with potentially many more residents and their visitors and the increased commercial traffic, I believe it's incumbent upon the city to come up with real solutions before finalizing permits. Hi, my name is Mark Thomas. Um, I'm a retired teacher. Uh, my first teaching experience was Santa Cruz High in 1976. Um, I also serve as a real estate agent for Lighthouse Realty locally. I'm also on the board for Habitat for Humanity. I've done development myself. I've done real estate myself for the last 30 years. I strongly support this project. I look at the SROs as a sustainable alternative for the future for folks that can't afford to live in bigger houses. Um, in my case, in particular, I like the idea that SROs will bring more children to the neighborhood. Um, our community is graying and becoming more like me. More aches and pains, more boring. I want to see kids. Um, I'd like the schools to be able to survive. We, in the last five years of my teaching career, for example, we lost 25% of our kids because they couldn't afford to live here. This gives us a sustainable long-term alternative. This and the other SRO projects. So I do appreciate that. I also appreciate the affordable housing. 
also appreciate the, the lean towards electricity and electric vehicles. Um, we're going through a transformation in terms of uh, transportation and the use of electric vehicles, and I think we'll be using less cars in the future and hopefully more public transit, more um, walkable neighborhoods, more walkable buildings, and this fits in that long-term future. I'd like to thank Doug and Peggy personally for sticking their necks out and doing all the work to take on a project like this. I know it's not easy. Um, given the pandemic, the cost of construction has gone up astronomically. The cost of materials, supply chain issues, it's not easy to build. For folks that would like to see things one story, the problem is, is it doesn't pencil out, meaning you can't afford to build it. Um, I don't look at Doug and Peggy, Peggy as gouging the community. I look at them as contributing to the community. And I love the idea that Food Bent's going to be with us for a long time. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the time to speak. My name is Ryan Meckel. Um, I am so excited that this project is here, and I can't wait to see it move forward. I remember when the permits were filed and the pictures went up on the city site, like the project, I kind of had butterflies around me all day. It was it's such a great project. I'm really thankful that the Food Bin and Herb Room have decided to address our city's housing crisis while also providing them a modern space that is sustainable into the future so that its loved local business does not have to leave, like many of our residents have due to housing costs here. I'd like to speak personally to this project. Um, I would have loved to live here when I was a student up at UCSC. Uh, I didn't have a car then, I still don't now, and I essentially paid for housing once I moved off campus, I was paying for parking that I wasn't using. Adding parking to these projects adds tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per space depending on how it's built, and those are costs passed off to the residents. That means higher rent costs, higher building costs, and higher cost of living in Santa Cruz. I'm glad we're giving people like myself more options like this to be able to live into the, in the city close to their friends, close to work, close to family. I don't have much more to add. I hope you move this forward. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Eric Schmidt. I'm also a resident of 1200 Block of Laurel. And I'm generally favorable to the project, but I do think there's a horrible blind spot around parking. Um, to put a scale to this, this room right now has about 60 people in it. So 60 units, the block, uh, of 1,200 currently has about 35 residents. We have about 23 spots out front. I don't know how we're going to make it through trash day. You were talking about trash day and how the logistics of that are going to work. If we have our cars in our driveway on trash day and no place to park on the street, we can't even get the cars out of the driveway and park them somewhere to get our cans out to the street. So uh, that's one point I'd make. And the other thing I'd say is when parking was brought up, uh, in the presentation, it was brought up as if it was responding to comments that were made, but from my perspective, it worked for expanding the, the parking for the, for the herb room and the food bin, but it only exacerbates the problem for what's going to happen on the block. So I think our block is going to experience whatever this experiment winds up yielding. Thank you. Hey, good evening. My name is James Mueller. I'm a resident of the Cleveland Laurel uh, neighborhood and uh, generally support this project, which I'm excited that almost everyone here that's in my neighborhood is, is in a caveat, but supportive of the project because we all know it needs to happen. I think there's, as was mentioned, a couple huge blind spots here. One things I'd just like to bring to the council's attention is uh, under findings, there's uh, references, the findings on the, on the agenda packet here, uh, the staff um, report talks about um, all the references like the commercial requirements for setbacks and all those sort of stuff, but it doesn't reference at all any of the residential requirements, even though some of the findings uh, specifically say that they can interfere with like the uh, it reference, like the requirements for not having an uh, impact on the residential properties. I reference uh, staff finding 12, 15, and 18 specifically, if you want to reference those that say like um, site plan should respect the need for privacy of adjacent residents, not impact residential quality of the neighborhood and areas. And having a five-story building right behind single-family homes just gives all those windows an opportunity to look down into, you know, otherwise private places where we raise our families. And I think 
it's not a hard ask to say that there needs to be some design elements in there. They've got separators to provide privacy between the windows laterally, but have some sort of vertical thing to limit the view down, because there's an entire wall of windows facing directly into our neighborhood where people can see down. Um, the parking, I think, is, as mentioned, aspirational. There's, um, as, a, as Doug, and I've known Doug, known Doug for five years, he said, you know, there's going to be two people per unit, you know, for couples. That's 120 people moving into this block. We're naive if we think that not everyone's going to have a car. Any, even a small percentage of people with cars is going gonna, is gonna to be a really tough case to solve there. We need to have, before this is, and I wanted to prove, but I think we need to have, I'm asking for, to pause the approval of this so we can get um, some real parking solutions involved with either permitting. Um, there's a really lovely letter that my neighborhood all got together and wrote that was submitted um, that I'd just like you guys to take a minute to read. It's a uh, proactive, it has solutions in it that we've come up with to try and help like what we think would be a solution to some of these problems that being the traffic, the privacy, and the parking. That's a uh, uh, for you. Thank you. My name is Doug Martin, and I'm the neighbor in question. Hi. <laughs> and thank you for your comments. Uh, I th and, and I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak a, a little bit. I, have, I did submit a letter to uh, both to Ryan and to the, and to the, and I hope that you had a chance to look at it. I just want to hit some of the high points. Uh, local, born and raised in Santa Cruz, lived my whole life on the west side. In 1985, I bought the, my house on next door to, behind the building there. 2000 or in, uh, in uh, 1985 to be near my wife's family's cottages that we have cottages behind the uh, the, the present structure there along along the Laurel Creek um, and we've been renting uh, providing housing for students and teachers and people for 40 years um, and many have stayed for 10 and 20 and 30 years they like living there it's it, it's it's a lovely place um, I've always loved the Laurel Creek. I used to catch crawdads and take them home and put them in my aquariums. Um, lots of wildlife there. It's it's declining over the years, but there is a, a nice varied wildlife there. Um, I added in my house. I added gardens and chickens and solar panels, and uh, I'm trying to make my house as green as possible. Uh, I I I appreciate your your efforts to 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 make keep Santa Cruz green and make it greener, and I try and try and live as, as green as possible life as I can. Um, I, and then later my kids, walked from, to Bayview School, walked to Mission Hill, and walked to Santa Cruz High. And that's, that's, it's, a, it's a family neighborhood that we live in on Laurel Street. Um, and my grandkids live next door to my, and they are now walking to, uh, well, my granddaughter's riding her bike to Mission Hill. They're, it, it, it's a it's a neighborhood of children too. I'm, I'll carry on. Let me give you a little I, bit of time I'm going to go here. first. Yeah. Uh, Unless but a, a, a 66 yeah. or whatever height that building is just not working for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's out of scale. Uh, it invades our privacy. It it, it invades our our security. Um, by blocking much of the sun, it would devastate my gardens, devastate my solar panels, which I'm still paying for, um, and totally shades three to four of our cottages that are on the back side of, of the photo there. That um, it, We don't really see angles of that, but there's three or four cottages there that are completely shaded by, the, by this building. Um, and more importantly, the shading blocks the sunlight to the, to the Laurel Creek in that riparian corridor right there. Um, the Laurel Creek purifies the water. It it it, it as it flows down from UCSC down to the down to the Larry Lagoon. It removes pollutants. It nitrifies ammonia, turns it into nitrates, which is plant food. Um, it pulls carbon dioxide out of the air, sinks the carbon. You talked about you know. I, um, and it gives us oxygen, and all of all of that 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 wonderful place, that wonderful riparian corridor. It doesn't work without the sun. It needs sunlight. It needs, um, and when you deprive a systems like that of of, of the sun, 
you get dark, dank, moldy, dead wasteland down there. And I, I'm, I just don't want to see that happen. Um, just please rethink the height of this building. I, I don't think we have any argument, but please, if you could, if you could look at it, um, come up to come up to Laurel Street. Come up and walk around. Walk around the building and look down and, and imagine um, the impact that that building that size would have on 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 a on our neighborhood. Um, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Rachel Marconi. Um, I'm actually a longtime planner in Santa Cruz. I lived on Mission Street next to uh, Falafel and the Chocolate Factory for 11 years. And now, for the last 10 years, I've been associated with the 1200 block of Laurel, where my partner lives, and I now am a renter there. Um, so, long time commitment to the food bin. I've probably spent $1,000 every couple months at this place. It's an important business. I'm really glad that it exists. Um, as a planner, it is. It, I'm torn on this project. Of course, I support densification. I support adding more affordable housing into our community. I'm incredibly disappointed that this is not an affordable housing project. And that the cost per square foot for these units is ludicrous. It's going to be in the $3,000 range probably for a 280 something square foot thing. And to raise your child in that like tight space, I'd like to see the health statistics on that of having people crammed into these small units. We've seen it in other developments around the country where the projects get shut down because having that many people in one space doesn't always help um, public health. I found, I don't know disrespect to Ryan, but I did find several errors in the staff report. Um, our Laurel Cleveland neighborhood um, letter attachment two identifies several of the findings which are erroneous um, that Ellen and others have already mentioned. This is not compatible with our neighbor. It's not to scale. It's very disappointing that none of the renderings show this building from the north side looking down towards it, from our neighborhood, from Cleveland Avenue, from King Street, even up the hill. This thing is going to be a monstrosity. I support, OK, one last thing is, as a planner, I strongly support thing, planning and how we, as a community, came together. We pulled the Mission, the mission Street plan has some problems, but Many parts of that were a compromise. We came together for that. The zoning decisions, the general plan, these are well-vetted decisions that came forward. And I think all of us could live with a 40-foot building, but the 60-foot thing that is right next to Doug, other Doug's house um, is just too much. So thank you. So you'll notice I'm letting people go a little bit over, but like, don't count on it. I still might cut you off at two minutes. Go ahead. Craig Schindler, uh lived in Santa Cruz for 40 years, <clears throat> was a professor at UCSC in environmental ethics. Our home in Bonnie Dune burned down in the CZU fire. We lost everything. You learn a lot from that experience. You learn how precious it is to have a home. We didn't have one for a time. It, we, we're very blessed to have purchased a home on Laurel Street in this neighborhood, four doors down from this building. You also learn how precious it is for people to have affordable housing. I go to the food bin regularly. I buy my lunch there every day. I love these guys. We're not against the development. We're not. But please, come to our neighborhood and look up at the building from our point of view at five stories. Try to understand what it means to our backyards the riparian stream, there's a hawk nesting in the backyard next to us. There are ducks that come where our little grandbabies come and play. This is happening currently, OK? There's going to be maybe 120 people in this building. There's no way to mandate that they don't get cars. We can't enforce that. There will be some cars. And yes, it's good. We're not building parking, 
but then something's going to happen to our neighborhood where people are out looking for parking. There are delivery trucks coming through on Laurel Street all the time already. There are going to be more delivery trucks because the food bin is now improved and wider. Okay, what are we going to do about that? What are the things we could do? You could turn Laurel Street into a one-way street like at CVS or like PAMP, where you stop, you could get out coming this way, but you can't go in, so therefore we don't have all that truck, that traffic thing. You can mitigate the size of the building. That would help a lot. Um, you can turn the windows, the big windows that are staring down on all our backyards on Mission Street and the, pack, and the packages. Um, you know, read the letter, please. It was precious to move into this neighborhood. This is an amazing group of people. The idea that the whole neighborhood come together and write this letter to all of you, please take it seriously, okay? We try, we wanna to work together, we wanna to make the project work, but we wanna make it work in a way that isn't a mess and that is truly sustainable. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Dan Versman. I live down the street on Van Ness, just a block away, but I'd like to speak about um, local contractors. I'm one of them. Uh, it's really been a shame to see the buildings go up downtown using uh, labor from out of town. So I just want to speak about my personal family business, but I know there's quite a few businesses that would also um, probably be eligible to work on this project. Um, warehouse Strike Flooring Outlet, my dad started in 1980, uh, since has passed on to me. Many of our employees have worked longer than I've been alive at the company for over 35 years. Um, and, you know, we weren't given a shot to work on any of the big local developments that have been going up. Um, we've been really saddened to see that people from Southern California or uh, San Francisco or Oakland are working on these projects. Um, and we're competitive, and we can do it. And I'm sure a lot of other contractors that are local can too. So um, that's really what I came to say. Uh, one other thing about it is there was, uh, at one point, my dad told me uh, the city council did say that local subcontractors, subcontractors had to be used for developments, but uh, the builders chose not to um, abide by those regulations. So um, maybe there needs to be some sort of more strict um, rules regarding that, because even if you say that local subcontractors, subcontractors have to be used, they might not even abide by that. So that's what I have to say. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Modular. I'm Brian Pearson. I've owned a home at 327 Cleveland for about 20 years, um, which is on the corner of Cleveland and Laurel. And I'll get to another, I own a triplex at 1303 Laurel Street. Um, Get it. The project is, is going to happen. A lot of this is performative, despite the slides that are pretty disingenuous. The slides are fairly toothless. We intend, we want our vision, you know, it, it over and over and over. There is, we all know how this goes down. Very little of what their intent actually gets followed through. What I want to talk about is parking. In on Laurel Street, in between Mission and Cleveland right now, it's the de facto food bin parking lot. It already is. And food bin owners and employees have somehow, without the community input, has parking permits in our area. And, and the parking office will say, oh, well, the theory was that people are at work during the day so food bin employees can park in that neighborhood. There's work from home. There was a pandemic. Nothing changed. So what I want the council to do is to say, if you say this is a no parking no parking development, let's take that at face value. Right now, the two hour parking up until, you know, the hours, the triplex that I own at 1303 through 1307, I rent under market to students and they all have cars. So don't kid yourself. Like 60 units, more than 60 people, they're going to have cars. If you say it's a no parking development, then protect the community with beefed up parking regulations. The parking office says they take a neighborhood by neighborhood approach to parking impacts. Make that happen. Thanks. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Nancy Connolly. Dreaded this moment, hate public speaking, but I'm doing it. And so this is going to be all over the place. And Eric, I want to say hi to you, my old neighbor. I haven't seen you in dog's age. Um, OK, so I live on uh, 1200 block of Laurel Street. This is very close to my heart. I'm not an eloquent speaker, so I'm just going to be all over the map. Just be prepared. Um, generally, I'm in support of the project. Again, not at the current proposal, at a much smaller degree. Ellen said four stories. I would love three stories. Uh, I look at all the other buildings in town. This is going to be the highest building in town. And it's in a small community. I grant it. I understand it's on the Mission Corridor, but we're not downtown. Someone said, oh, we're part of downtown. We're not part of downtown. I'm sorry. We didn't move to the Upper Laurel to be downtown. Um, a few things. Here I go. Be prepared. Uh, Doug said, um, or someone said it would be half the amount of parking, but the double, double the size of the store. How does that work? Just, just, that's just common sense. Two, it's supposed to be a grab and go supermarket, but I don't know any other grab and go place that doesn't have parking. Taco truck, taco spot, we've got Taqueria Vallarta, huge parking lot. Everybody's got parking lots. We don't have parking. So, okay, going back. Traffic, my three issues are traffic, safety, lack of compatibility with the neighborhood, and a sense of community. The other things were um, parking. As was mentioned, there is no issue with trucks down the street. There are. I live on what big trucks come down all the time. Five o'clock in the morning. So I, I know that to be true. That's not accurate. Um, sorry, I, I just could. Um, five, um, it's going to be for students. We know that. I know we're helping out UCSC. Uh, I have friends who live nearby that have 200 square foot apartments. They get requests all the time for five people to live in that. So if we're looking at 60 units, what does that look? That's a minimum, minimum of 100 people, 120 people. It's just unrealistic. It's not going to, I don't know how this is going to um, help the issue of affordable housing. There's only eight units. So I think that should be come off. It's not an affordability issue. Um, please read our letter. And then the last thing I want to say is it's, it, we keep going on about bike. It's a biker's paradise. Santa Cruz County is in the worst 20% of bike, of lack of safety in the United States. There are accidents left and right. So it's not a biker's paradise. Um, and this does not lend itself to safety. And there's no other project that I know of in the county that is geared toward this being a bike safety community. And so thank you for listening. And I appreciate your time. Thanks. Hello, my name is Andrea Hudson. I live on the 1100 block of King Street, so I'm not as directly affected by this project as a lot of the other people who live closer, but I will say that um, parking is a huge issue in, um, on King Street as well. And um, when I see a project like this with possibly 120 or even more residents and then only 12 parking spots, it just seems super not realistic to expect that those some of those people are not going to be parking in the neighborhood. I recently redid my driveway on King Street. That was a fun adventure. And um, I would frequently, many times, like during the day around 4 o'clock, I would have nowhere to park within a block of my house. I would be carrying not joking, 60 pounds of groceries to and from my car with small children in tow. It, it, there's nowhere to park. There, it's just not enforced in that neighborhood at all for the two hour um, street parking. Um, I actually really wanna talk about, like very little has been said about the safety of the crosswalk um, on Mission Street, we've got Mission Hill Junior High and Santa Cruz High, and we've got kids going to and from school crossing Mission Street every day. The idea that there's like no mitigation, no one has anything to say about like how we can make this safe when we've got a five-story building and people just driving so fast on Mission Street, like 
no enhancements to like a bike lane or anything like that. Like, it just makes it, it's so scary. I, I'm a teacher at Santa Cruz High and I ride my bike, I would ride my bike every single day and it was terrifying every single day. I actually changed what school my kids went to because I hated crossing Mission Street so much. I, I mean, for real, like this has like been a huge factor in my life here. Uh, I, I hope we can pay some more attention to that. And um, uh, uh, the walk score and the bike score, what? Who, who came up with those numbers? I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of infuriated. An 89 for the walk score? Wa no, no. Walking in that area is hell on earth. It is not. I, I'm baffled by those numbers. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Lowry Burton, and I'm a longtime Santa Cruz resident since 1976. I feel like I kind of have an unusual circumstance, and that I used to live on Van Ness Avenue, and a longtime food bin lover. Love Peggy and Doug, big proponents of their business. And in keeping with it being a beloved business, I continue to shop there, even though I now live on Baldwin Street. So I'm one of those people who I'm no longer do walk to the food bin. I go to the food bin because I love to shop there um, in my car because I'm coming home from work or going to work and pick things up. If I feel like there's cross purposes here. Great if you have SROs for people not to have vehicles, but if you want to have a sustainable business, you need to have a place where people can park if they're getting groceries. I really appreciate the spirit of the design of this building, but the practical implications of the reality of it are not sustainable. There is a big difference between this drawing. Mission Street does not look like that. Look, <laughs> look how bucolic that looks. The trees, the peace, that is not the Mission Street I know. Also, just in the verbiage of this project, what you say that you're after, that you want to have multifamilies. Multifamilies are not SROs. I realize that there are variances, and you've traded things to get the height. We had a very similar project, since I now live on Baldwin Street, that's at the end, that was proposed to be five stories. We had a similar neighborhood rallying like this. It's three stories. It's harmonious, which is also one of the words that you used in describing your desired building footprint and spirit. This is not a harmonious building. The other thing I would like to say about the parking spaces is, realistically, if you have a building that is getting supplies, you need to have a place to unload them. And also, I want the food bin to survive, but they're not going to be able to survive if people can't shop there. I do want to just inject a little humor at the end of my thing, which is Peggy and Doug, if you want to make some extra money with the new business that's going into Emily's, just sell munchies and brownies, and perhaps you could make up the difference. Thank you very much. Hi there, how are you guys doing today? Um, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm the founder of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition. And I wanted to speak today kind of like from the perspective of we're talking about the next generation and the demographic that this development is obviously catering towards, especially as it comes to parking. I can tell you guys that uh, talking to my roommates, talking to my classmates, and talking to folks that I know right now are commuting insane distances to get to campus, that this is the exact type of housing that they wish they could live in. Um, this is the kind of thing that we know when folks are access to a high quality bus corridor that's going directly and it's going to be improved significantly with the Santa Cruz Metro's plans for increasing frequency on all the routes and additionally with the new plans from uh, Caltrans to go ahead and improve a lot of the crosswalks and crossings along the entire Mission Street corridor that's going to be happening in the next couple of years. Um, and so we know that Projects like this pay towards those transit, those transportation improvement funds, towards those streetscapes improvement funds. And so I think when we're looking at the broader themes of um, the lack of parking in this project and lack of safety for biking and walkability, this is the kind of thing that we can do and we can improve that can actually help fix those things by providing the funding to actually create those changes. And when we're providing fewer parking spots, um, data has shown that in the end, it means that fewer people own cars. 
because as soon as you're paying for parking that you're not actually using, then you have an impetus to actually own a car and fill that parking spot. And similarly, you also, and I completely agree with all of the folks that are talking about the fact that we shouldn't be allowing people to park on the street that don't have the space to park it off the street. And I think that's something we should all be applying across the board to make sure that folks, we aren't burdening the on-street parking availability by saying, you know, like Tokyo, the way they do it is you can't own a car unless you have an off-street parking space where you know you can park it. I think that's a perfectly reasonable and something we should be supporting, especially when it comes to our climate goals. Because when we look at our emissions in the city of Santa Cruz, 69% of our emissions are just from cars. That's it. It's, it's the entire discussion is how we get around. And this is the exact kind of project that will go and help that. And so in the end, like to speak to my personal experience, right now I'm living with six people in a house that used to house a family. I don't want to be living in a house that is not designed for six people. We don't have the space that we need. We don't have the kitchen facilities. It's insane. And we much all would have rather lived in a place like this where we could all have our own individual space and not be displacing folks that otherwise would need a family-sized home. And so in building this type of housing, we're able to actually have these. And so I really do understand the concerns of every person that came here today with, you know, we, of all the different things related to, okay, if we took it down by one or two floors, or if we changed, maybe added one more floor of parking below ground, or did X, Y, Z. But I, I do want to point to the overall housing crisis and say that when we are talking about this housing and we are talking about our impact on the community, Every single time that we go and we say we need to do this and we do this and we do this, it means the housing itself gets more expensive and it means that we end up with 9% of students at UCSC being homeless and the highest per capita homeless population in the nation um, because it keeps on rising the cost of what actually it takes to live here. And so I think that there are always going to be a lot of reasons to deny a project, but I really want to look at the alternatives of where we are today and look at the reasons for why this project is really ideal for the location it's being presented at. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Aaron Olson, and uh, three or four years ago, I bought a uh, property on Rig Street, which is just right around the corner, 314 Rig Street, and uh, it was a rundown owned by a landlord and developed into something I think is, is much nicer. It, I, I, the city did allow me to put um, multiple units on it. Um, it was tough to stay within the height limit. Um, we did that, and I rent to 15, 16 college kids, and easily 70% of them have cars. None of them ride bikes. Not a safe place to ride bikes on Mission Street, and there's no bike lanes. Um, I think they, you know, they should stick to three stories. There's, if there's a hundred people in that building, there easily be 60 cars. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Isabella Story. Thank you for having us and allowing us to speak. Um, I am also part of the Student Housing Coalition, and I wanted to echo um, how amazing having this additional housing would be for a lot of UC Santa Cruz students. Um, there's an incredible lack of housing for students, and that causes some of our peers to have to commute from other areas, such as the lower um, Bay Area and areas like San Jose, and I know students who commute from San Jose to <coughs> Santa Cruz for school because they're unable to find housing in Santa Cruz, and that commute is a nightmare. Having to drive on 17 on a regular basis is not fun, and um, yeah, and so having a, a project like this go up that would provide a lot of places for students to live would be really beneficial. Hey, uh, my name is Bodhi Shargell. I'm here speaking on behalf of myself, but also as a member of the Student Housing Coalition. Um, I, I'm a UCSC student myself as well. Uh, I, I really, I, I really appreciate when we have turnout like this for public meetings, even though it does make um, for a longer night for you all. Um, and, and and that's because we're all here with a shared goal of building a city that works for its people, right? A, a city where we can all live the kinds of lives that we want to live. Um, and and I, I really appreciate that. And, and we're, we're in that kind of 
uh, effort together. Um, and, and I want to point out that, you know, for, for UCSC students right now, um, the prospect of living car free is, would be the least of, of our problems for a lot of folks. I mean, as, as we've heard mentioned, people are commuting from, you know, South County, from Salinas, from, um, uh, over the hill because there's nowhere for students to live in, in Santa Cruz. And a project like this is a step towards a solution to that. You know, we hear um, all of these issues that we have with um, uh, bicycle safety, pedestrian safety, um, uh, lacking public transit infrastructure. And, and a project like this is a step towards improving that. It's not going to solve everything. Um, it, these are, you know, incremental improvements. And so I, I want this to be one part in a larger commitment to working to improve the, the problems that people have with the way that our city works for people. Um, and that means working to improve affordability, working to build more um, housing suited for students, and working to make our, our city a place that's safe to get around um, by bike, by walking, by public transit, and a, and a way where that's, and a, and a place where that's convenient. Um, so I, I understand y'all don't have much choice in denying this project. I support this project. I think it's one step in the right direction, but it's, it's just one step and we have to remain committed to, to improving our city on all of those other fronts as well. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Ethan Singleton. I'm a student at UCSC, uh, also with the uh, Student Housing Coalition. Uh, I've been uh, fairly fortunate uh, when, when it comes to housing uh, comparatively, but um, that said, in, in the past year, uh, there have been two separate times where I had to find, um, uh, find temporary housing, and both times it was I incredibly stressful. It, well, it was not at all a foregone conclusion that, that I'd find a place, and I, had to, um, and I had to tell my professors I'm not sure if I... Um, I'm not sure if I'd be able to att attend classes, uh, uh, classes or not. And um, this is at the same time as that uh, Wall Street Journal article came out um, about that very same thing about the problems that uh, UCSC students were having, and it was pretty surreal. Like, oh, it's not even—it's not really a me problem. Like this, uh, this is a, a much bigger thing. Um, but I, uh, you know, and I, I have found a place uh, for the for, for my, my last school year here. But uh, like I said, I've been fairly fortunate. Um, I, I know people who have to commute like multiple hours a day, um, who, uh, who who had to, had to be put on like academic um, uh, academic probation or whatever the whatever the policy is, just because they they couldn't find a place. And um, you know that's just people I know. You go like second hand, third hand, and there's really no end to it. And um, it's really reflected in the, uh, the the data. Nine percent of UCSC students are currently experiencing homelessness. Uh, Two point three thousand um, homeless residents overall, and the median income. Uh, home price here has uh, topped a million, and uh, it's for this reason that I'm very, uh, I'm very, very supportive of this project. Um, uh, a, f a, f a few things I'm especially um, uh, grateful for. Uh, one is that it's, it's on the west side, which is um, very, uh, very, very exclusionary. Um, you see, uh, you see, uh, Santa Cruz doesn't just have an affordability problem; it also has a, a segregation problem, and. Uh, you know, well, well, one look at the zoning, uh, the zoning map will make that pretty clear. And the other thing is that 15% um, of the units are designated very low income, and that's exactly the kind of um, uh, pr pr proactive action that I think is necessary to address this this problem. So I support this project. Hi, um, my name is Natalia Gray. Um, I'm actually a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I support the building of this project because I. Um, not currently, but I actually used to live off of Laurel, and so having housing like this would have been awesome when I was looking for housing, because the only reason I actually ended up living off of Laurel was because I spent five months looking for housing that I could afford and housing that, like, didn't make me feel unsafe. So kind of coming at this, um, I think we should build this project because just having housing available for students is so important. There's no reason that my friends at school should be homeless and living in their cars. I think having this project built is so important so that even if it isn't um, the most affordable housing, the students that can afford it will be able to live there and they won't be in other places and that could just free up spaces for more students to live close to school and be able to avoid those long commutes like others said. Yeah, so I do support the building of this project. Thank you.
Hi, hello, commissioners. Um, my name is Nicholas Robles. I'm part of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition. And first, I want to mention that I really agree with all my peers and all the other UC students who couldn't be here tonight. Um, so I have a couple points. Uh, so from what I've heard, that this building project is not going to be including any parking. And I have to say that I heard as well, and I want to stress this point, that the agreement to signing onto a lease at, the, at these buildings are going to be that you don't own a car. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think for anybody to say that parking is going to be a hassle, I don't believe so because nobody's going to be owning a car in that building anyways. Um, and then I have to say as well, UCSC has been increasing their cost for parking at campus and it's now $530 when it's been like, when it was 300 something last year. And so that was a $200 increase. And I can say as a commuting student, I really wish that I didn't have to own a car and this building project would be really helpful, especially with the metro system increasing their services and along with expanding their services, um, which is an improvement to Santa Cruz. And it would be really great to show the commitments and the support to use to the Santa Cruz services over here. Um, and then also to say that UCSC students right now on campus already live car free. That's a lot of students that can live comfortably and they live with within their housing and they have food and markets and there's a lot of services that are being provided for students without using any cars or vehicles. And I have to say as well that Having a store here in the housing project is going to be able to increase the unplanned trips that occur at the stores. So the food bin will be having a lot of unplanned trips from students who are going to be coming home after a long day of class at like 8 p.m. And they're going to look at the food bin and they're going to go, man, I really want some food right now. I haven't been able to eat all day. I've been studying. I'm tired. Like students at UCSC are already playing paying premiums for M&Ms. It's like $3 at the vending machines, and they're paying that, and it's selling. It's selling. So <laughs> I was going to say, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good deal for the food bin as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Don Radcliffe, and I live at 323 Cleveland, which is around the corner off Laurel. And I know that if this goes through, I will not be able to park in front of my house. In addition, I don't think that Brian has been totally honest with you about whether you can not demand parking spaces for this place. I've read Senate Bill 92, and I see that you can. Okay, so if you keep with this, you'll be hearing from my lawyer. Okay, because that's just not true. And, and this business of... It's got to be a five-star unit or it doesn't work. Well, that's not our problem, and we're not responsible for providing on-campus or near on-campus housing for UCSC students. They need to build that on campus. Okay, and as far as the creek, it took me 10 years to get a permit to rebuild my garage because I was 50 feet from the creek. And, you know, I don't appreciate you tearing up the rules for somebody trying to put in a new unit like this. And as far as I know, he said this, the food bin can't exist there unless it's subsidized by the 60 or 59 units that are going to be paying high rents on top of that. The students think they're going to get low rents. They're not. You know, it's going to be a million dollars a year in rent that's going to make this thing work. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alex Cardenas. Uh, I live here on the west side, and I own a business here in Santa Cruz. Um, definitely not opposed to Mission Street becoming more beautiful, 
becoming harmonious, becoming something where there's places to buy things and more housing. Um, however, I don't feel that this building that I'm looking at right now does any of those things. I don't think it's harmonious. Um, I think the height of the building is lacking consideration for the unique character of Santa Cruz. It's just too big. Um, I definitely want to just shadow what everyone else is saying with just making it smaller. I don't see why that's a problem. <laughs> um, I don't think it's necessarily solving much housing crisis. What students are gonna be actually able to live here, ones that only have wealthy families or have a trust fund? Um, I would love the students to have a place to live, like we all want a place to live, right? All of us are suffering right now from high rent and from just the economy turning into what it is. I understand the need. I wanna see that as well. I don't think this will do it. I really don't think they'll feel as happy about it when they see what the rent is gonna be. Um, it is a single resident occupancy. What about the students who are like, oh shit, I'm sorry, <laughs> like my friends just got a place. Um, and then they start having people crashing there. They have friends over, where's the parking with that? Not just with the residents, but what about visitors and friends? There's just not a really clear, clean, concise way to make this harmonious with the people who live there and who are planning to live here long term, hopefully have their families continue to live here and not get kicked out. Um, we're widening the sidewalk, but we're not talking about any bike safety. It's a 100% biker paradise or whatever. I bike it every single day. It's not, it's pretty scary. Um, so I would just like these things to be considered. Um, yeah, I would just love to find a solution that respects our past, respects our present needs, and comes to a harmonious solution for everyone that lives here. Uh, Cause this is really an eyesore. That's all, thank you. Hi, my name's Cameron Lewis. I live at 1229 Laurel Street, so about four houses down. <clears throat> my family moved here uh, three years after my middle son graduated from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so I completely understand the plight of the students and what they've been facing. I've lived with it. I've had a, a son go through it. So in principle, um, supportive of the aspirations behind this project. But I, uh, this is the only comment I have, well, two comments, sorry. Uh, one is I urge you to read the letter that my neighbors and I put together. Um, I think you'll find it uh, a valuable experience to get our perspective from that. The second thing that I wanna, that is really a question. Why is UC Santa Cruz administration not involved in this conversation and in this planning? If this building that I'm looking at is going to end up housing so many students, what does that say? Why aren't we expanding facilities at the top of the hill? I don't know if you guys have the answer to that. I certainly don't, but I think somebody needs to pick up the phone and call one of the administrators at the university and see if they can come down and join the conversation. Thanks. Hello, um, my name is Greg Jacobson. I live on uh, 226 Van Ness. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I get really nervous when I do things like this, but I'm going to do the best I can. Um, <clears throat> so think 20 years from now. Um, this, this building seems to me like a precedent. Um, there are any number of uh, uh, properties along the corridor that are going to be developed like this. And from what I've heard, and forgive my naivete, but um, the general plan for the corridor was three stories. And what we're looking at here, because of um, density bonus, they've upped it to five stories. Um, hypothetically speaking, what if the property was 25% smaller? Does that mean that the density bonus will take it up to eight stories? I mean, I don't know. Um, is this the kind of thing that, that is going to be 
happening every time another parcel gets developed like this, um, you'll be facing the same questions. Um, uh, so, um, I don't know, it seems to me like sticking with the original plan uh, would be better because now you're, now you're thinking uh, the long-term future of the whole corridor and um, limiting the size so that people up on the hill can actually still see the ocean. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, I'm John Wallace, and I live at 1220 Laurel Street, which is three houses down from the project. Um, uh, and so I had a whole pile of things to say, but I think I'm going to talk on something different. With I have a couple degrees from 50 years ago from UCSC, and um, and so I have compassion for what what's going on there. You know the costs of education these days, because when I went, it was almost free. So and and. Uh, there's always been a debate, I guess, between who who's responsible for what, and and I do think the university needs to take some responsibility here for the high costs. The fact is, people who get a better education get more money, pay more taxes. It, we should see it as an investment, not as a going to school, I mean, and yet they've made it a burden with the high costs. People get out of school in trouble. Anyway, but I, I really agree. I, I feel real sorry for Doug, and I, I'm only a couple of houses down from, from him. Uh, but it is a burden already parking. Across the street, they're building a house. Okay, single-family residents is, are being allowed to put new houses in back. So there's two houses with, and I'm not sure where the zoning stuff has gone and where where our vision for a city is. We're being the universities dictating things and the states dictating things and promoting things that I think are we should stand against so that we have the quality. I, I've lived here 50 years, lived in the 1220 house for 25 years, and it is a, a great place to live. Um, for a while, I rented to six students. I, I had a house on Western and was renting the house on Laurel, but then I moved to Laurel uh, 25 years ago. Anyway, uh, ho hopefully you take that into concern that the quality that we're seeing when we jam up big density, we have problems in the traffic, we have problems with the dams, the water, and the, you know, just the services and the whole bit. So um, take it into consideration. Well, thank you. Hello, I'm Dave Wallace, and first off, I commiserate commiserate with all the Laurel Street neighbors. But the the fact behind it is, is that 50 years ago, UCSC had 4,000 students. UCSC now has 20,000 students. In 20 years, they're going to add another 10,000 students. Where are you going to put them? If it's not here. Is there some other magic places sprouting up on Mission Street? The west side has really not carried much of the burden as far as any density housing so far as what I've seen. I live on the east side, and we have bigger lots, and we've seen a lot of it. And a lot of these projects that we are upset about never get built anyway because they don't pencil out. They don't stand the pencil test because it's expensive to build. and they die on the vine. I mean, I don't, I don't know where they're all going. Um, is this project perfect? Uh, you know, absolutely not. But at some point, we need to build some housing. And it's not, you know, I mean, there's a few downtown 
but not nearly enough to absorb what we have coming in the next 20 years. And I think that's, you know, maybe it's the shape of things to come and I don't know. Good evening, Jeff LaPierre. I live on King Street, so I'm a little less impacted. Been there 20 years. Uh, mostly I'm here to talk about parking. A lot's been said. I just, one idea I want to contribute. Any housing development, I think, would reasonably have a system where you have some guest passes, right? Well, we could ask Doug. I vaguely support the project. Doug, lease 20 parking spaces nearby. You know, there's a clothing store. Used clothing, big parking lot right across the street. Maintain these 20 spots, have guest passes. You know, that way when friends and neighbors come in out of town, they can rent a guest pass, put them somewhere responsible. If we don't put any kind of requirement like that, and that doesn't seem like that far-fetched, then we're obviously just dumping those people into the neighborhood. There's just no two ways about it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Smith, and I live on Van Ness Avenue. And I've lived there 40 years. And I love the food bin and um, walk there with my grandson and, and I drive there on my way to and from home. And I like the idea of affordable housing and I support that idea. And I really feel like this is too much. It's, there's too many problems with what it does to that in that location. And I feel like if it were just over where the old Mellis Market was, it would have been a better location. And it's just, it's way too much, and it's dangerous. And I guess I'm, an, I'm a nurse, I'm a public health nurse, and I was at Community Hospital when we had the big earthquake. And, and from the standpoint of safety and the challenges of dealing with getting in and out and that many people in a building where it's very little access, I think it's dangerous, and I just, I feel like with the bicycle, so much of it being bicycle friendly, all of us on the west side know that the bicycles have challenges and there's safety issues with bicycles, and I probably won't drive to the food bin anymore if that gets built. I'd rather go to the west side, and it just, it's not like you're going to have my business there because I don't want to have to deal with a lot of bicycles, a lot more people. And even with my grandson walking across over to Emily's, it felt like a safety. I mean, we really practice major safety things. So I think consider the challenges with safety. Consider the public health challenges of having that many people. It's way too big a project for that space. And I, I don't know what tools you have to deny or to change the, the system, the way it's set up. And I know your hands are tied, but I'd sure look to try and find a way to make it more suitable so that it would work for all of us. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Natasha Guy. I live on Otis Street. Clearly not from here, but I've lived here a long time. I hope to stay here forever, if they let me. Um, uh, I am a color and material designer by trade. I specialize in aesthetics, the way things look and how that makes people feel. Uh, if we're looking at health as one of the reasons why we would or wouldn't build something, mental health is part of that. Uh, this is a dangerous precedent. If we build this kind of thing all along Mission, the Mission traffic is already insane. And I worry um, for that in terms of our health, our mental health, and I worry about what that means for King Street and people using that as a way to cut through. I have two kids, one and three, who I hope will go to the local schools. I will not want them to walk around the local neighborhood if this sort of thing continues to be built up in the area. And I'm really disappointed and emotional about the fact that this could happen because I love it here and I want to stay here and I didn't choose London or San Jose. The style of this, I come back to aesthetics, is neither in keeping with the um, landscape, the area, the beautiful wood uh, eclectic houses that we all know and love, 
neither is it modern in a timeless way. And I stress that I do this every day for a living. So this is something I feel really strongly about, that a 12-foot butterfly is not going to curb how we all feel about how it looks. Um, I would urge that we, again, I, I, I've probably funded partially, partially this project because I love the food bin. I've not shopped there for the last year out of my own um, morals because I can only vote with my buck here. Um, but I also would love them to, to, to continue with this in some form, in a more considered, beautiful manner, and um, bearing in mind us residents um, who are either dr uh, affected dramatically, like Doug, or um, the rest of us who live in the neighborhood. I hope you'll take another look at it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Susan and I live on Rig Street. Um, first, I just want to say I really applaud the students that have come down tonight and used their voice on behalf of the plight of affordable housing. Um, it's vital, um, but it's also transient and temporary. Students graduate and move on. I'm here as Natasha, I believe, on behalf of families in the neighborhood, having recently moved to the area with a young child and the intention of being a long-term per permanent resident. Um, it's equal parts insulting and laughable that this project is proposed as a solution for families, whether directly as housing solutions or as a positive impact on neighborhood safety or quality of living. I reiterate the critical problems on the height and the parking. Um, this can maybe come up in future things. I've certainly not seen debate or discussion on uh, why all the SROs. I don't know why when we're talking about two bedroom stats and young family stats and all kinds of things, why we're looking at studios of such size. Um, I would just say if we want to nurture families to thrive here, this proposal needs swift reconsideration and to involve and respect the community on a deeper cross-functional level, please. To echo previous thought leaders tonight, let's harmonize. Thank you. My name is Donna Haraway, and I have a little different perspective. I live at 312 Cleveland, and I've lived in Santa Cruz for about 40 years, and I've taught at UCSC most of that time, but I speak as a neighborhood person and a person who uses Mission Street a lot, uh, shops at the food bin and, and the herb room all the time. Uh, if housing of this kind, three, four, and five story, uh, SROs and also other kinds of housing uh, with commercial uh, space on the bottoms, more of that kind of building along Mission Street, in my view, would make for a much more vibrant community. If coupled with serious enforcement of, uh, you know, no car, no parking permit, sorry, uh, if you're going to park your car, you've got to find a building to park it in. Serious enforcement, serious development of safer bike areas, serious development of better crosswalk. Uh, my problem is my dogs are terrified of Mission Street and won't go across. Uh, you know, the children and dogs are not safe on Mission Street. Little things are not safe on Mission Street. It's a big problem. This building doesn't solve it. But this kind of building, including five stories of, I think, a lovely design, belongs on Mission Street. I think the people on Laurel Street bear the burden and suffer for it, and I think that should be mitigated as much as possible. But this kind of development is what I want as a neighbor in this immediate area on Cleveland Avenue. Hello, my name is Care Frazier. And I live down by Neary Lagoon. Um, I, um, I work at the food bin, and I've worked there for more than a year. Uh, I've shopped there for decades. Um, and the thing that I would like the council to be um, noting is this concept of the uh, place that, that uses bicycles and, uh, and, and Having, and having a place that where the premise is that you don't get a parking permit when you live here and you travel because we live right on the, on the transportation corridor. I'd like the, the city council 
to be encouraging that model. I didn't have a car when I was going to the university, um, and my kids have gone to the university on the bus too. Um, and I, I think that that is uh, something I'd, I'd like to see more of. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Anyone else like to speak? Yeah, be sure to get your name over there when you're yeah, done. Yeah, Rustin Hognes. I just live around the corner on Cleveland. I go to the food bin all the time. Uh, I love it. I like this project. And I want to leave you just with an image that of, of someone who might move into there that isn't a student. Uh, my sister, 74 years old, rides her bike, walks, takes public transportation everywhere, had to move to Seattle to take care of my uh, father, would love to be here. She went to school in Santa Cruz. This is an ideal sort of place for her. So think not only of students, think of uh, retirees, other people who want to get away from cars. It's a good place. Thanks. <laughs> All right, last call for public comment. Thanks again, everybody. We'll uh, go ahead and close the public comment period. So if I remember right, we need a motion to go past 10 o'clock, is that 11. correct? 11, okay, thanks. Um, how are people doing? Do, do anybody want to take a break or just keep going? I'm all right. Yeah. So next, I uh, want to give the applicant a chance to rebut anything that was raised uh, during public comment, if they'd like to. Yeah, so, uh, we'd like to address the car issue. Obviously, that's a really big concern for everybody in the neighborhood. Um, the owner, any owner of a building is allowed to um, legally not rent to somebody who owns a car. You can check it with the DMV. You can, um, so to speak, be prejudiced against the car owning class. They are not a protected class of people. Um, so, so we can choose that. We can, we can say that you cannot rent to anybody who owns a car. You can fact check it with the DMV. And, um, and I don't know what the measure would be for this, but I'm assuming there could be some kind of long-term protocol that checks that as you renew your lease or every six months or something like that to make sure that people aren't moving in and then buying a car and being an impact to the neighborhood. So that's one big thing that we can do around vehicles. A couple comments about the commercial drop-offs in the traffic. Um, I think we could manage that much more effectively with our vendors. So ensure they're not in the neighborhoods. Um, and yeah. Okay. Say one more thing too. Um, Doug and Peggy are really committed to making this as manageable for the neighborhood as possible. I, thought the recommendation about shared parking with another commercial space is a really great idea. There's obviously a longevity issue to that. If that property gets developed, then that parking goes away, but we're absolutely open to exploring those options in the meantime so that that impact is mitigated for as long as possible. Another comment about parking and on Laurel Street. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we do buy five permits for our employees and now heard from the neighbors and so what we do now is we buy them on Cleveland and we buy them I look for like the neighbors where there's wider streets and there's less cars which there's quite a bit like uh, north of Laurel and Cleveland so down Cleveland there's some just wide open sites right? so I try and buy the permits farther down the employee has to walk a little bit but it's still relatively close so I think there is parking in and around some of those neighborhoods, not all of them. Laurel takes the brunt of it, but spread out into the neighborhood, there are some spots. So I think some of it could be you know, mitigated, but um, yeah, there's, and, and the residents have first option on those spots. 
they can buy those spots in front of their house. I don't know if you guys knew that, but you can buy the spots or they become available for the businesses on Mission Street, apparently. So that's how, that's how I understand that. Doug, I, uh, I live in the neighborhood, sweatily walk around in the early morning. You may see me. Um, and my memory is that most of the streets have permit, neighbor permit parking already. Not saying it's effective or enforced or any of that, but the signs are up yes. in most yeah. of those blocks already. Exactly, yeah. Two-hour parking, Monday through Friday. And I think it's mainly for the students don't park there yeah. and then just leave their car there all day. Again, I'm not saying that that solves the problem or anything, but I yeah. just wanted to recognize that the tool that exists, which is a very weak and sad tool. Correct, is, is yeah. And we get, our employees get tickets, and then I yep, yep. go down and try and get them waived. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's bring it back up to the commission for more uh, discussion, and I'd like to hear a motion soon. I've got a few things. John? Um, there were comments made about the base density not actually being 20%, um, et cetera. Our inclusionary ordinance specifies a percentage of units in a in a in a project that have to be made affordable um, can be done at different levels and that affects other aspects of the of the design <clears throat> but the incentives that are offered and the density bonuses that are offered they do not reduce that amount they reduce they you could read it that it reduces the percentage required but the truth is we don't lose any affordable housing based on these inclusionary uh, the density bonus or any of the other incentives, all the in, all the units that would otherwise be required under the base density, they're still there. That's one thing. Um, I think a lot of the people here already know that with a lot of the incentives, um, the prohibitions on parking under AB under 2097 is it? Those are state requirements that we don't really have a lot of control over. And so to a degree, we're not able to really affect that. Um, there are also comments made about uh, UC housing um, being the problem. And the difficulty is that housing at UCSC can only be paid for out of the proceeds of the people that are paying rent that live there. They can't, there's not money that the state gives university campuses for building housing. They can't use tuition money. They can't use other sources of money. It has to be strictly paid for by the people that live there. And with all the sustainability requirements that the university has, um, it's very difficult for them to keep the price of housing down. It's a, it's a, we all want to be sustainable, but that really costs a, a huge amount of money um, for the university and anyone that's trying to do it. Um, the corridor plan, I am very sympathetic to arguments about that being better, but that was rejected by uh, many members of the community and a previous council. And it's, I, we could maybe be avoiding a lot of these discussions if it hadn't been. Um, similarly, all housing, <laughs> I think it's fairly well known it improves affordability, accessibility, and equity. And I'm a strong advocate of density for all those reasons. I feel like, uh, you know, if, if small units are not are not considered family units, it's I think it's pretty easy to see that if you have three couples living in a three bedroom home, and each of them can move to a small unit and have their own place to live, that makes and that makes a family home affordable or available. And it's, it's difficult to, you know, look at all the nuance of everyone's housing situation, but I think just as a general rule, um, small units relieve pressure on family homes and make them more available. Um, I'll just leave it there, but I'm, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the impacts on the neighborhood, but the lar the ones that are mentioned most uh, routinely in the comments, they're largely things that 
the we as a body don't have that much control over. Thanks for all your time coming in, though. All right, Commissioner Conway. Thank you. And first of all, I want to thank everybody for um, coming and for being a great neighborhood. And um, I read every single letter, most of them more than once. Um, and um, Doug, I really want to thank you for bringing this project forward. Um, I was there one of the days when the freezer broke and um, you were handing out um, the what was us being in the freezer just so it wouldn't go to waste because please take this, we can't fix it. I was genuinely worried that we were gonna lose the food bin altogether and um, that it just made me so sad. And I'm um, really pleased that you have come up with a way to sustain the food bin and um, way into the future. And I do feel like you've done it in a way that is really thoughtful and I appreciate that. Um, I feel like this um, project is the respectful outgrowth of our times, which must continue to change, and um, I think that this really is bringing it forward. So in the midst of much change, we're continuing with our fundamental value of protecting open space by focusing growth within the urban boundary. That is one of the, that is, I would say, the key um, value um, within this community. This project makes that possible and sustains it. Um, and it also, another one of the choices that we made with our general plan, we decided that we don't want to spread the growth that we must accept into neighborhoods. We decided that we don't want to have fourplexes and sixplexes and small apartments, which was would have been a perfectly acceptable choice, and we decided not to do that. And instead, we're gonna put it along our transportation corridors. Now, inevitably, someone lives next to it, you know, and there, there is a transition space. Um, I know as I've watched this project be conceptualized um, and looked at the solar on the house next door um, and really thought about how do we manage the impacts of change. You know, so again, I'm gonna stand up very loudly in support of staying within our urban growth boundary and developing density along corridors. Um, I, I wish that as a city, um, and I think that we do have opportunities to look closely at what those impacts mean. It's, there's not that many properties that, that are gonna be like um, the Martins. Um, we looked at a um, multifamily project, also of SROs, further up Mission, but across the street. And that shadow, it shadows Mission Street. Um, I, thought, I was very touched by your description of your garden. Um, and of course, I, I go by there all the time and I'm really aware of it. Um, and and that, that is important. The impact there, it is important. Um, but so is this project. Um, and small units mean that uh, the single family homes, I have one across the street from me, um, it's five bedrooms in that one. They've, the owners are doing better than they were, but two kids, two students, sorry, um, in every single room, that was a lot. Um, so, um, another thing that I'm committed to is um, housing policies that allow housing to be built. So in other words, we have to accept that um, it has to be built at the densities that make it pencil. And I know a lot of people think it would pencil just as well at three stories. And um, I can tell you, I haven't looked at this pro forma, but I've looked at a lot of them, and I just don't think so. Um, so, and, and also not burdening projects with, we've, we've really killed so many projects by burdening them with more and more layers um, that we think are making it a better project, but what it make, does is it makes it impossible to build it. And um, uh, let's see, I think there were quite a few misunderstandings about the approval in the development process, but I don't need to take that up right now. 
I would like to address what is really a red herring of saying that if, if you rent to students and they all have cars, therefore all of these students are going to have cars. I just have to call BS on that one. You know, tell them they can't have cars. Dis tell them you're going to rent to students who, who don't have cars. And those are the people you'll rent to, and there are enough students. And it's true, a lot of students have cars. They live across the street from me. Um, I know that they do. Um, but I just don't think it, I think it's disingenuous to say that there's not a way to manage that. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess I, I could go on about a lot of other things. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the staff recommendation. I need a second first. You need a second I'll, I'll second the motion, and then we can. I think some plenty, conditions plenty of people. approval coming. There's some. some things. That work? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, thanks everybody for coming out and speaking. I know I lived on King Street for six years and um, raised my kids there. Now I live on the Lower East Side, a little bit further away, but um, I know that area very well, and I used to go to the food bin quite often. Obviously, there's a lot of um, emotions around seeing this kind of development on Mission Street. Um, the size of it is quite large, the largest that I believe is on Mission Street right now. Um, the thing that I think one of the, I forget his name, um, but he brought up a really good uh, point is we are going to start to see a lot more of this development. It's necessary. We are growing. Um, but what kind of development, where it is, how big, um, these are all, this is why we're all here right now. That's why I'm here, sitting here. Um, when we have these density bonus laws, it gets really tricky and our hands get tied. But we, we're not totally tied. Um, and the way we decide um, our base density, I brought it up earlier around um, including commercial space using... I don't believe that that is a necessary requirement. Am, am I, I'm checking in with staff right now. When we, when we are, because we're going to see a lot of these mixed use developments, you know, storefront on the bottom, residences up top. When we're looking at calculating the base density and we're using that commercial space to um, bump, kind of bump up the numbers of, of the base density. Is that like a, do we have to use the commercial space to do that? Is that in some sort of a uh, code? Oh, that's interesting. Just, it would seem to me that using the, the, um, the commercial space would actually lower the base density, right? Because it eliminates area Correct. that would be dedicated to residential Correct. uses. Yeah, that, that, that's my point. So when we're looking at size of buildings, and, and especially when we're getting into density bonus, we're adding 50% on top of that dense, dent, the base density. That's when we're losing affordability. That's where I'm, and I'm going to disagree with John. Um, we don't. I, I agree that we don't lose affordable units, but we also don't gain affordable units. Um, and this is a big, big issue that we're going to have to look at as we move forward with density bonus law. And in this case, if we took away that 2,675 square foot commercial space out of the base density calculation, um, I wonder if that would, I mean, that would affect, obviously, this project quite drastically. It would also probably make it a four-story building. Um, that would be interesting. I just think it's interesting. Uh, uh, give me one more second. Um, you know, we have a general plan for a reason, right? It's been, uh, you know, these are kind of our guidelines of how we'd like to see things move forward. Now we have a base density law coming in and really drastically changing. I mean, like the gentleman said earlier, I mean, we have a FAR of 0.75 to 1.75. FAR is kind of a, a way of determining density. This is 3.86 over twice what is in the general plan allowed. Um, that's crazy. I mean, we're, you know, we are going to start growing. We are going to start moving forward, and we want density. But three point, like tw over twice is what is in the general plan right now. Um, that is a lot. And 
So my thing is, you know, this is one project it is before us now. And we do need density. We, do, we all love the food bin, let's be honest. It's beautiful, I love it, it's very Santa Cruz, it is Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm glad that it gets to stay. Um, I do feel that five stories is a lot. And, I, and I, as much as our hands are tied up here, um, it's not totally tied. And I do believe that if we look at the way we calculate base density and projects moving for not just this project, but projects moving forward, that we could somehow mitigate where we do have some control as a community, you know? So, and on, on that note, um, you know, I, I'll let staff talk to this base density idea around using commercial space versus not, but also I wanna say to the public is we are just a public body, we're just a commission. This is gonna come before the, the city council as well, probably in February, I imagine, if everything goes past, if things get passed tonight. Uh, we are only one bump along the way of this project. So for all the people that came out tonight, Use your voice and, you know, vote the way you want to vote and the way you want to see your fut the future of Santa Cruz. So. Um, I was just going to offer some clarification that with the um, objective standards that were approved, there is a more specific requirement for the area of commercial on the ground floor. So there will be some more, um, I guess, assurance of how much of the ground, ground floor is gonna be commercial. At least there's a minimum that's set. So, um, and, then, and then beyond that, you could put um, residential units, and, and I don't have it all memorized, but it, it might be live work units, but there are some ways that you can get residential on the ground floor. But this one is before, so it's not subject, no, subject to the objective standards. Can I, um, so the que then my question is, um, what, like when we are determining the base, the density, I think Ms. Dawson talked about it earlier, is like, where is the limit? Like if the guy said, if it's 25% smaller lot, are we talking eight stories? Um, well, it would, the, the base density is gonna be calculated on what you volume. can fit within the site standards. Right. Yeah, so and PR, whether we setbacks, yeah. And do we don't have any sort of code around or law in you know, a law around using commercial space as base density calculations, correct? We just decide if we want to do it or not. Do you mean like ca counting the commercial space as residential as a residential unit? No, when we're yeah, just using the square footage to calculate the base density, like we were talking, like you just said, we, we, you could use some of that commercial space, but with the objective standard, I know we're getting into weeds right, here, well, but do you understand where I'm coming? Where I'm, where the the idea that I'm saying is, is, do we get to decide as a, do you get to decide as staff, how much of the commercial space or not to use it or not to use it when calculating the base density on a mixed use project development. So, so you're asking once they reach, the, if for a project that's subject to the objective standards, once they reach the minimum amount of commercial space that's required, if they go beyond that, do we say, well, that could be residential space and that could be a unit? Um, well, that That's one part that it could go that way or it also could be like, this is the minimum, the whatever the minimum that is just not gonna be calculated at all. And whether they choose to add to it or not, that's that's their choice, right? I don't think that that's been considered. I know there's, the, you know, state laws around, the, you know, that protect these types of developments and that, you know, tell us to look at the project as proposed. Mm -hmm. um, that specific language is included in a lot of the state laws. So it, it would be something we'd have to look at. Okay. Yeah, and I recall there, be there being some litigation around mm -hmm. that I, I could imagine. as well mm -hmm. with certain jurisdictions on density bonus saying, hey, your project could be this, right. and, um, and then getting that ruling overturned at the courts. 
All right. Well, I, I'm thinking back to when we read the downtown plan. It's a different context than this project, which we're kind of straying away from. But we had all these discussions about ground floor, and like, you, in my opinion, you kind of want retail. You know, I hear what you're saying. Like, just, I'm just the exercise of it. The whole, the whole it was point. was harder than you think. The whole point. I'm the reason I'm bringing this up. Or, uh, the whole reason I'm bringing this up is that we do have control. Yeah. Like, don't act like we mm -hmm. we do have some say here. So, like. To, for us to say, for, for me to say that I just have to say yes to this, that, that's not true. We do have some, we do have, we do, we do have some say. I, I'm not saying we can, I can totally say no to this, but we can at least ask for, you know, we can figure out a way to make this a little bit more agreeable for everybody, I think. I'd like to. Yeah, I think for, um, so f to, to respond to the density bonus and what you need to make in the way of findings, I mean, there's there's a few. Um, first, it needs to meet the minimum um, affordability requirements, which our ADU, or I'm sorry, our SRO ordinance automatically qualifies a project for <clears throat> a 50% density bonus. Um, to uh, get the, the waivers, um, there needs to be a finding that the standards in our zoning code physically preclude a development from achieving that density that's allowed. Which one of them is Those whether are, it's a negative impact on the neighborhood, correct? Right. Well, no. It's so in order to deny a density bonus, you need to find that there's a specific adverse impact upon the public health or safety uh, unless the project is disapproved. Um, and then it says, as used in this paragraph, a specific adverse impact means a significant, quantifiable, direct, and unavoidable impact based on an objective, identified, written public health or safety standard policy or conditions as they existed on the date the application was deemed complete. That's a pretty tall order. Yeah. It's, it's almost, it's virtually impossible to make that finding on a project, like a, a project like this on an infill urbanized site. We've got a biotic study that says there's no habitat whatsoever. I mean, there, you know, there's really nothing to hang your hat on to either reduce density or deny the density bonus. Um, the, only, and, the only question is whether, what do we use to calculate base density? That's what I'm bringing up, and, which and, is arguable. Yeah, and I also responding to some of the comments made um, from the public, um, you know, the state's getting serious about housing laws. They have a, a new housing accountability division within HCD. I know, I've talked to them. We've had inquiries about it. Um, if uh, the city violates the Housing Accountability Act, um, we're on the hook for $10,000 per unit. So if you were to reduce density by 20 units, it would cost the city $200,000. We'd have to reverse our decision within 60 days and pay lawyer fees. That's if we go against the if housing we, If we lose in court, right. right. Which we would. Uh, Cindy, I just want to, the motion is like to pass the project, so. I want to hear what you have to say, but if we're moving toward a different motion, that should be a separate discussion. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple comments, and then I'd like to uh, propose a friendly amendment uh, condition to add. Um, so uh, just to build on what Commissioner Maxwell said, um, I do want to remind the public of the process, again, that we are an advisory body and the decision-making body is a city council and the folks that you elected there. So hold them accountable accordingly. Um, and I would also just say that, you know, the people passing these state housing laws are your elected Senate and assembly members. So, you know, just as engaged public, we need to keep an eye on the ball here. And a lot of, and you're hearing about these state laws that continue to pass in Sacramento. And so I think that's something just to remember that it does trickle down. And you know, you're, you're feeling these impacts in your neighborhood. Um, I do wanna just make a couple general comments um, and, and disagree with, uh, respectfully disagree with Commissioner McKelvey. Ma math is math. And 
the way that the density bonus law is implemented is that the overall percentage, we have a 20% inclusionary in the city of Santa Cruz when a density bonus project gets put forward and the numbers get, and you get the density bonus, the overall percentage of units you get is not 20%. That's just math. On this project, it's about 13%. So that's also just something to keep in mind as we um, move through thinking about these projects. Um, a couple of other things. Um, I would just like to um, recognize um, one of the local contractors who come up and just again say city council is in charge of project labor agreements and using local labor. Um, that's something to continue to mention. That's not something under our purview. And then when we're talking about these projects, I also want us just to be very honest about what, what we're building. We're, we're not building family housing. Um, SROs are, that's, that's not what this is. Um, I'm not, we do need um, smaller units um, and we do need more affordable units. Um, this is 13% this is affordable. That's not enough, but that meets the current standards. And as the commission, um, we are tasked with looking at the laws as they are written, seeing if the project meets that, and moves forward. Um, I do want to just second this idea of um, continuing to bring up with council and staff how we calculate base unit, because that that's gonna, when we apply the density unit, right? If, if it was 30 units and we were applying a density unit, it'd be different than it was 40 units and the height of buildings would be differently. And this idea of using commercial space in that calculation, whether we do it or not, I think is something to continue to pursue um, as this moves through the process. Um, lastly, just a general comment before I make my condition, um, as someone who, bikes as their primary mode of transportation. Um, we really need to get serious about conditioning on projects on these corridors, um, bike and pedestrian safety um, as a condition and not just as a, it's something we'll think about. Um, as density increase, traffic increases, um, people's patience decrease, um, it's very dangerous. I actually walk more now than I bike because it's so dangerous to bike. And I certainly never bike on mission. And when, when campus opens every year and I see students biking on mission, I roll down my window and say, go to King. Do not bike on mission. So we need to get really serious about it. Um, so along those lines, um, we did, uh, the developer did seem to be open to a condition. So I'd like to make a friendly amendment for a condition. And I think the wording would be something like um, for the developer to work with Metro um, to um, take advantage of existing programs to develop bus passes. Is that something you guys would be okay with? I'm not seeing any. Are you about three bus passes? What, what did I just say? <laughs> that, the, <laughs> to, that the developer uh, would work with the Metro um, to take advantage of existing programs to implement bike passes for residents. Bus passes. Bus passes. Bus passes. Yeah, not bike passes, bus passes. Thank you. <laughs> In in past we've added the words like for residents that request them because a lot of times they have them and right. like nobody students wants them. Probably. Probably. No, no need for Doug to pay I, for I'm them happy if that works as recently. as request as for residents that request them. I also need to jump in and I had here in all caps: Do not ride your bike on Mission Street. So thanks for <laughs> mentioning that. Do not ride your bike on Mission Street, people. <laughs> You'll die. Yeah, a sign so that says it. <laughs> sign that says it's okay. Okay, I have, um, as the maker of the motion, I'll have, I'd have to accept it as a fit-friendly amendment. Um, and my problem with this, and I, I don't know that I'm dead set against it, but um, these residents are already going to have bike pass or bus passes. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing. They, if they want them, they're going to get bus passes. I don't think that they, um, that there's a financial reason why they couldn't. I certainly think that. Um, working with Metro and linking property management um, company 
to make it as easy as possible and seamless as possible makes sense. I see no reason why we would burden the project financially to have them take on a financial cost for it. I don't think that, I don't feel like the peop the resident necessarily need it and uh, it doesn't seem fair to the project to me. However, I mean, if you don't care about that responsibility, I think what you're asking Doug to do, maybe I misunderstand. I might. Yeah, I think you misunderstood. So the, you're, the you're condition, not asking the project to provide bus passes. I'm asking them to work with Metro to take advantage of existing programs. Oh, if there's programs, that's great. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. That's I mean, I still don't like layering extra conditions, but I mean, that's, this one seems okay. I just didn't want to add an extra cost. I think adding a, some coordination and ease of use makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I would accept that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, I think we're coming to a close here, so I just wanted to make a few comments before um, before we wrap this up. Um, first off, um, just in, I received some emails actually during the meeting um, from a engaged citizen that was just talking about all the improvements that are gonna be coming um, from Caltrans to this particular intersection, and they include, as I see it, uh, high visibility crosswalk improvements, um, bike boxes and uh, uh, renewed ramps and other things like this. So, um, you know, the need for a condition on, on the development I don't think is necessary as these improvements are coming. So I just wanted to address that as there were some concerns about people crossing mission. I have some of those same concerns with some of my kids at Santa Cruz High. And um, so, you know, that, that seems to be in the works, um, which I'm really happy to see. Um, secondly, I just wanted to touch base about um, affordable housing and just talk about that for a second. So, you know, on these individual projects, many of the projects that seek density bonuses do have uh, overall affordability percentages that get watered down beyond what on the surface we ask for as a local community, right? That is part of the density, density bonus issue um, that ruffles a lot of feathers. And ultimately the courts have decided that these density bonus units cannot have affordability requirements applied to them. And that is the incentive, right, for a developer. They say, we're gonna include X amount of affordable units in return to make this uh, project pencil out, you're gonna get X amount of density bonus units. And those, um, you know, it does water down that percentage. But this is, you know, it's a forest in the trees issue because these types of projects allow us to meet our RENA goals, which make us uh, eligible for a pro housing designation, which makes us eligible for more funding for affordable housing. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think our last housing element, we secured close to, if not over 50% affordable units out of all the units we built out of that eight year period. And the reason we are able to do that beyond other fees that we charge and other grants that we can secure is because we build housing, right? That's one of the best things that we can do in this particular situation. And I just wanna highlight that, that you know, our overall housing output is geared very much towards low income earners, or at least it has been over the past eight years. And now with the pro housing designation and projects like this that will add eight very low income units, those are very, very difficult units to build. And in fact, every single one of those units requires close to $20,000 in subsidy from the developer. Okay, so that is a big ask. And that is the reason that they get these density bonus units. So I just want people to be reminded of that and that you know there are benefits to these types of projects. And while yes, there are costs, there are costs to this approach. Um, this is done at the state level as Commissioner Dawson did mention um, you know, talk to your state representatives about how this is impacting you. And um, that at this very moment, that is the way things are. But I also think that one of the big upsides to this particular site is that, yeah, you have some very accessible amenities here. You have good restaurants, you have uh, within walking distance, you have a medical clinic. Within walking distance, you have athletic fields. Within walking distance or biking distance, you have a lot of these other things going on. and. 
the economic uh, potential of clustering businesses and dense housing in this particular place, you know, could, you know, add some good benefits to your neighborhood as well. And so I understand the parking issue. I think that uh, the parking issue is probably one of the biggest downsides to what the state is doing right now. And I do think that some of the conclusions uh, that the state is reaching around just eliminating parking requirements, I think, are somewhat unrealistic. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm going to support this project as uh, as uh, amended by conditions of approval, or uh, I'm sorry, a friendly amendment. And uh, I, I think that you know these types of projects are beneficial to the community. And you know, with any kind of luck, that. Emily's across the street is not going to be a medical marijuana facility. It's going to be a coffee shop, all right, if I have anything to say about it. So, um, you know, <laughs> you know, marijuana delivery is a thing. So, you know, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be that close. So, um, that's my comments. Thank you for everybody that came out to speak. All right, anyone else have a few things to talk about? I have a Um, I know we did talk, speaking of the parking issue, I know you guys, uh, the de developers, and uh, talked about the somewhat idea of not agreeing not to rent to car owners, but that's just, you know, uh, I, you could not do that. You know what I mean? Like, that's just a saying of, is there anything in, like, I mean, this is the thing, if you have an empty unit, and you're the only people that, you know, at some point you got to fill the units, correct? Can I say something? Sure. Yeah. Um, Come on up just so the mic can hear you okay. uh, in case anyone's still awake at home. Okay. So if somebody has a car, they're not going to really be able to park because you have to have a permit for Laurel. You can't get a permit for Laurel because your address is going to be on mission. Mm -hmm. We, the food bin, only get permits because of some magnanimous something or other, thank God, because we'd have our employees park. So we're, on the one hand, we intend to not have cars there because that's one thing we can do to not piss off the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, there we go. And then another thing is we are feeling like people might be logical who want to live in these places, that they're going to self-select not to have cars because what are they going to do with their cars? They're going to get tickets. Enforcement will probably increase because everybody's going to be pissed off and start hassling the city to increase enforcement. I've gotten a ticket there. I don't know what mm -hmm. people are talking about that you don't get tickets. I've gotten a ticket there. So anyway, there's a self-selection aspect. There's, um, and yeah, we don't want cars. This is like our idea. I wanted the roof to have plants. I, we want no cars. This is like progressive. That's my say. All right, uh, Commissioner McKelvey, did you have someone else? All right, uh, I have two quick friendly amendments to propose. Ryan, would you put that text I sent you earlier up? Um, I don't want to add crazy conditions, but I think these will be pretty mild. Um, let me know if you feel differently about them. <coughs> So what you'll see here, everybody, I copied the conditions that are in there. Uh, Vivian, I don't know if you can zoom in on the top one. Right. Yeah. I got oh, whoever's got it. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you guys for putting that up. So the numbers changed, but there's two. those are the two light trespass conditions that are in there. They're pretty solid. Like we started this process many years ago. They were mm. hardened up <laughs> by some dark sky there. folks. Those are in there already. Okay. Plan submitted for building permit issuance shall show all exterior site lighting locations and fixture details. All exterior building lighting shall be shielded and contained in a downward direction. No exterior lighting shall produce off-site glare. That's a big one, really. Glare is huge. Exterior site lighting shall be provided along pedestrian pathways and in the vehicle parking area, which right there is conflicting with that neighbor, which we get that. Security lighting shall be motion sensor only, because like always on security lighting is not effective according to science. And so then I'd just like to add that photometric site plan shall be provided to verify this. And then, you know, I get kind of 
cheeky writing conditions, and I put three more in there just for y'all to think about. I'm not suggesting we put them on this project, but like we could clarify, maybe the first one I'll suggest it. Uh, let's see how you feel about this one. Building department staff shall observe the final lighting at night before the CFO is granted. Maybe that happens already. We have to do that for green building inspections to see if, how it looks, you know? Yeah, I'd, if the majority of the commission wants to go there, I'd recommend that it be planning staff to, okay. to check I, on that. I, not that we um, want to go there, but. Yeah, and if you wanted to go the direction of an ad hoc committee, I know we've done it uh, for. Let's leave that one there, that's pretty aggressive. Okay. Yeah. Um, we should go look at these buildings and see if we did it or not, but uh, we wouldn't want you to coordinate us for that inspection. Um, I think the words no lighting shall spill off the site in the direction of the residential neighborhood nor the creek is too strong. And then we talked about that lighting facade issue, so I trust that will be handled naturally during design now that I've raised it. So I'd like to propose a friendly amendment um, to add that photometric site plan shall be provided to verify, and that I think goes better with the top condition, Ryan which I believe is 15, but put it wherever you want. You want to add it to a condition or just have it stand alone? Uh, well, well let's, let me look at it. So plan submitted for building permit issuance, blah, blah, blah. Let's add it to the end of that condition. This? Because the plan just puts in writing what condition, what says one up there is actually saying. So is this all one condition? Nope, no, just that first line. Just this first metric. line? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for doing the editing for me. Mm -hmm. Oops. Cool. Do you guys get it? That's just my ask there. I do, but I have a question. Yeah, mm -hmm. first sentence. I wondered what we were suggesting for modifying the language so that, sorry. Modifying the language so that um, we also kind of favor the placement of any luminaires lower to the ground. I love this. I thought a lot like about Like bollards and things that are going to illuminate the ground that needs to be illuminated rather than having large light fixtures. You know, it's it's more economical because there are fewer of them, but yeah, it would be much more... Do you want to respond? That's Please. Sure. Yes. Oh, of course. Of yes, course. Yes. Of course. Yes. Of course. Right. No, because there's going to be that conflict. With I don't know what that language should be, but that's. No, I think I that would be an effective that. thing to keep the dark sky objectives in mind. I have two questions. So that's good, Ryan. I like putting that in there. If everyone's all right with that. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. 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 Well, I wanted to just get input from all the commissioners. Go yeah. For it. Okay. I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. this is, I love that this is your area. Mm -hmm. um, it's That's not fine. my area. Um, I'd like to know how much does it co additional cost is there to the project to create a photometric site plan? Is that negligible? Is that Don't easy? Know, but our, the, is it the, a lot? I see it on every forty in a department building on my desk. Five and to ten thousand uh, dollars. Okay, all right. Because I I hate how some some one of the things we've done to prevent getting any housing built is just to make it too expensive by I agree. hanging, treating COAs as a, like a Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> I hear you, Julie. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure that I am so keen on the um, planning department staff going out to the final lighting at night before it's granted. Aren't we just, they're doing all of this. Why are we doing this extra thing? It's staff time. They're going out at night. I'd, I don't think we're accomplishing anything. Okay. So, so I hear you. My experience with this is the it's now the Hampton Inn down at the end of Mission Ooh, Street. Yeah. You know, is the Sunset bad. Inn? Is that right? I can't remember what it's called. So yeah. it's a large building. We put these conditions on it. Contractor mm -hmm. blew it on the wall packs, and they're just like blasting light yeah, everywhere. It's, really it's just bad. one of those like dumb things, so you're and right, nobody I, noticed. You're and right. I walk by. I'm planning commissioner, volunteer, walking by at night, and I'm like. What's going on with these lights? Don't we have these conditions I saying that don't too. spray light into your neighbors? So contractor came out, put these little metal thingies on. The, the stupid thing about lighting is it's stupid easy to shield them right if you mm -hmm. just like put five seconds into it. In my experience, so so I'm not coming out of left so field. Okay. I, I just want to. If what, Eric and I, me had been out there, you know, at night, uh, we would have immediately been like, yeah, those aren't going to work, and it would have saved everybody a lot of pain. You work well past dark. 
<laughs> well, and I was just going to say they are out yeah. after dark pretty. <laughs> pretty I, I would just okay. like to add right, right. to that yeah. that on Hanover Street, there's also a same thing. Okay. Like all those conditions were there, and I can guarantee that they do not meet the conditions right now, no. okay. which is a block. Yeah. Right. So. so, Julie, I hear you, and I really thought about <laughs> cost because I'm here to build some housing. Okay. And I do not think this is a project killer or pain in the butt type thing. Really? More input? A little concerned about going to the shelf and Yeah. I thought about approve, but what if it's a different planning commission and they're all just like, we hate that light? Sure. Right? It's not even us, it's staff making that. To call. confirm? Uh, to confirm that the final Verify? lighting is That's consistent with I mean, the photometric right. study? Yeah, I was like, where are you here? It's consistent. Well, no, that's that a good point. That it, the staff shouldn't be is not technically qualified to evaluate if it meets the photometric study. So, um, yeah, no, no, that's perfect. But shall um, I'm just trying to think of a word. Why don't you just say verify this by observing the final lighting at night before CFO is granted to the satisfaction of the planning director. Too hard, too hard. Is that too much? Okay, um, I've opened a okay. Pandora's box. Here. Yeah, I just want to interject. We so we go. We will go out to the site. Yeah. The planning staff go out to the site anyway, and we'll observe and confirm that everything is done to the condition. So, um, this seems clear to me. If we see any offsite glare, or if there's any you know bright lights, or if something looks different than what's shown on the plans, then we would have a conversation with the planning office. That work? All right. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Oh. This is this is not to catch y'all. It's to just highlight it a bit more, and and put it in the document. And I, I will accept that. Cool. Okay, I got one more. Can we oh, scroll down more. to mech equipment? This one's Did we? I'm not sure that Mike is. This oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Are you good with that one? Okay. Thank you. This again is one I've worked on for many years. Mechanical equipment screening is in the code, and we talked about earlier to like visually screen. So those are, this is my brainstorming. Um, Ryan, can we add the word heat pump or remove air conditioners, one or the other? Mechanical equipment covers heat pump and air conditioners, but when you say air conditioner, it sounds like we're still living in the combustion fuel age. I'm sorry, you want? Just add heat pumps there. Add heat pumps. Mm -hmm. If that is all right with everybody, it's just a clarification. So the idea of this is that you don't have to see it, right? And acoustical control is super tough and expensive. So I'd like to simply add the words, sound control shall be considered when designing this screening and stop there. And I don't know anyone want to talk about this uh, next couple there. Excuse me, Chair. Mm -hmm. Um, just before um, more people leave, I wanted to clarify that um, this project is not going to the does not require city council approval. Yeah. This is the final approval, so um, it, if it gets appealed, then it would be. <laughs> so I want to uh, uh, yes, I want to touch on that too. Yeah, this to can be the last meeting, unless the neighbors appeal, and we could actually just go start building this project whenever these guys are ready to go. So I understand that everyone always appeals, and uh, that's all right, but just please try to be as constructive as possible. And like us with choice on this density bonus, you neighbors have the choice of appealing and extending the pain here in hopes of some other concessions or not. But I just want to say it, it does not by nature go to city council. You know, Mr. No, Stop this it. is too much. Uh, we're out of public comment. Nope, I'm sorry. We're, uh, you're violating the, the rules of this meeting. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can talk more afterward. No, this is enough discussion. Uh, stop, please. This is, uh, we're not in public discussion. We're here talking amongst the commission. So now is not the time to give us further input. I'm sorry it feels that way. 
Uh, nope, public comment is over. So mechanical equipment, I'd like to add those words. Sound control should be considered when designing the screening, not has to be decibel, 40, whatever. Okay, that's it. I'm all right with that one, too. And then, Eric, I'm not going to do the zoning administrator. She'll suggest best practices. That was bad. No, that bad idea. I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you guys feel about that friendly amendment? Good? Excellent. So I, I have a few comments, and then I'm looking forward to a vote. So, you know, I live in this neighborhood. I have kids. I have a mom. I grew up by Mission Hill on King Street. I currently, I'm, thank God, got a house way down on Miramar. So I walk through here all the time. I've seen it, so many of the people here. So I feel the impact. I really do. And there is serious impact here. Um, I was thinking about what's like the something this big that's ever happened in our neighborhood. The closest I could come to was that monster redwood tree at Laurel and King. Like that might have been taller than this building. So let me just say it, this is a huge ass building. It's big, it's gonna stick out, it's gigantic. It's gonna shade people. It's higher than most people in this town want, I think. And like, I don't wanna, I, Sean kind of alluded to it earlier and we do this thing where, and I've said it before, Oh, the state's making us do this. Oh, God, we have no control over this. This is just like political padding, you know? I want these units. I want more housing. And you know why? Because I have two kids, and the odds of me getting them each a single-family house to give them so they can live in this damn town, like my parents did for me, the odds of that happening are zero at this point in my life as 47. So I hope... By the time they're ready for it, they could get an apartment. And these eat affordable and however many other is not going to do it, but we're heading in that right direction. Also, my mom lives right there. And, you know, she's at 75 and getting older and lives in a 3,000 square foot house with five bedrooms. And it's crazy. So I'd sure love to have her move into an apartment right there than somewhere else much further away from me and my family and my kids. Um, can't say again, like the the terror of crossing Mission Street, I really felt that. Me, my kids, someone said it's like extreme safety. It's totally like that. It's like, you stop your bike 20 feet ahead. This project's not gonna change that. Traffic's already terrible. This is gonna add a drop in the bucket. I forget the numbers. I think peak traffic on Mission is 6,000 cars an hour, right? So if all 60 people hop in their alleged car, it's, not, it's a drop in the bucket. So. I get it, like it's a small thing, but it, things are bad. This is not gonna make it that much worse, I think. Um, okay, I don't wanna ramble on, it's late. Uh, for street cred, I totally remember the earthquake in 1989 after the power went out, and I could be, I was 13, but people were trading food in the parking lot of the food bin, in there, and that's like, that doesn't get much more Santa Cruz than that, like, hey, I got these beans, and you know, da 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 so. I just love that hippie part of our community. And this small business will go on. I can't say that enough. Inarguably, the project increases pedestrian safety on mission. A lot of people said that. We're getting a huge sidewalk. It's, what, 12 feet wide or something with a row of street trees. We got nine street trees, including around the corner. That's going to make this stretch of mission in that corner a whole new experience you know, new sidewalks, so I am fine with just updating it. It's gonna make things safer for most everybody. So I get a little bit grouchy, and I'll try not to express that on everybody, but this idea that it's an okay to be a landlord in the single family neighborhood two blocks away, renting the 17 UCSC kids who park on the street, but not okay for Doug to build a building that's designed for people to not have cars. I mean, that really just rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, I love cars, you know, I drove cars, I have a minivan, I ride bikes. Anyway, that just rubbed me the wrong way and I had to get it out. The, sh the parking is a shared resource. Like, I used to pretend like the parking program worked, you know, but it doesn't. Public Works hates it. It's a pain for reinforcement. They don't have the resources to do it right. Nobody has the resources to do it right, like a real city would do, which is charge for parking everywhere, right? Anyway, um, 
so I don't think the parking permit thing, whatever way it goes, is going to have any impact. Um, my mom's house is the perfect example. She's the first street without permits over on Kirby and King Street there. I, if I think right through down all those streets and Walnut, <coughs> and so someone living here might go park in her house, in front of her house. But her and her neighbors have the option to go and do the petition and get those permits and call the police. And you know, that's all there already. So um, I just don't think it, I, we have plenty of parking. There's eight parking spots in the U.S. for every car in the U.S., you know. So anyway, uh, let me stop on that um, soapbox. Oh, I have a quick joke. This will be the only bodega of all time where you can't buy weed once it's approved, right? That'll be across the street and not part of your operation. I used to live in Berkeley. Um, okay. And then a, a bit more of a rant. Suburbia sure as hell is not high density. Single family zoning is by nature and intent racist in my opinion. And so I'm sorry, but everyone can't have single family homes because it keeps everyone else out of your community. So in my opinion, every apartment built, affordable or not, is a tiny step toward racial justice, equity, all these things that I really value. Um, and I know that racist word is strong, but go research it. It's literally true. Zoning was invented in Berkeley to keep black people out. So, you know, um, again, I'm not saying we're forced to do this. I want to do this clear eyed about the impacts. And um, that just is how this goes. So we just can't do this anymore. You know, the NIMBY word I try not to use, but so many people said, love this project, but not by me. And that speaks for itself, in my opinion. Okay, so I'm in favor of the project. Uh, my last joke was, is it possible to keep the sign going during construction? Because boy, do I love that sign. And I think putting it in the rendering, like you captured my heart. Mine so too. <laughs> nice job, nice job. Yeah, cool, cool. It's an important uh, news medium in our town. Okay, that's all that I have. Can we vote? All right, Vivian, can we do a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Commissioner Kennedy? Aye. Commissioner Maxwell? Uh, I don't agree with the way that the base density is being calculated in this project. I do not say no to housing. I like the housing. I think it's too big, so I'm going to say no. Commissioner Palmas? Yes. Commissioner McKelvey? Yes. So with that, the uh, motion passes unanimously. No. No. Nope. Um, uh, five, sorry. Yes. Excuse me. With that, the motion passes five to one with Commissioner Maxwell against. Excuse me. So that, that ends the item. We have some more business, so if you want to keep chatting, if you can scoot out of the, the room, we'd appreciate that. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Do you have a long one? I have a speech, but it's not 11 minutes long. <laughs> oh, somebody's tired, I understand. Uh, so, Uh, this uh, is the end of my year at chair, so I have some brief words. Can I do that under informational items? Sure. Sweet. So I don't have a long speech. It's been a great year, you all. I wanted to appreciate you all. I remember like whipping out that housing thing a year ago. And uh, damn, do we approve some housing. So thank you all. Uh, I really appreciate you all showing up and contributing. This commission is so much stronger for each of your unique inputs. Uh, Mike, I love your teacher knowledge and reason. You know, you want to study things and get to the bottom of it, which is super refreshing to have some facts applied to this process. Uh, John, I love your architectural expertise. Thank you. And you always caution me against COAs, which I appreciate. Uh, Sean, it was fun working to save the, uh, that senior housing deck on the top of the eucalyptus project. I was thinking about that one. I think that's when we first connected. It was like, 
oh, we can do things together, and that was a fun moment. And that SoCal Street bike death ride, that was a fun that one too. It. So anyway, I love you, man. Uh, Cindy, you have good thoughtful comments on gentrification. You're always reminding me of the broader social justice perspective, which I really appreciate, sincerely. And we don't agree on math, but that's okay. Um, Timory's not here, but she has such great comments and materials and how important those details are to the building coming out nice. And Julie's like my rock. Thanks for slowing me down when I try to go too fast. <laughs> and you always get all those details about affordable housing and like pro forma is right. So that just impresses me. That's the end of my comments. Any other informational items? Sure, I got a couple. Um, so at the uh, January 9th city council meeting, they approved the wharf master plan. Um, they did it subject to removal of the Western Walkway and references to the, um, the landmark building. No, I'll say really. at the hearing, the, the petitioners who, who don't morph the wharf folks who have filed lawsuit against the city had indicated that if the Western Walkway was removed, that they would not pursue further litigation. So that may have played into the decision. Um, measure M. Uh, the, the analysis of, of that measure, which uh, the drafters call the housing for people measure, um, is on the council's agenda for uh, this coming Tuesday, the 23rd. Uh, the city did hire a third party consultant to prepare the analysis. Uh, and, the, and just briefly, um, the consultant's report finds that the measure is broadly applicable throughout the city. Um, it would constrain housing supply, re resulting in less affordable housing and less market rate housing. It would constrain the city's ability to comply with state law requirements um, and would have a significant negative fiscal impact. Um, that full analysis is on the city's website um, for that council meeting. It's item number 40. I'd encourage you all to, to take a look at it. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's a presentation they had, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so upcoming schedule for February, we have the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance Coastal Permit that'll be before you on February 1st. Um, and then you'll recall uh, the downtown hotel on Front Street was continued to the February 15th um, agenda. So we've got those two projects locked in um, over your next two meetings. That's all I have. Great. We don't have any sub. Oh, one more. Yeah. I have an item to refer to future agendas. Yeah. I believe this is my last agenda. And I uh, just want to thank staff. I know the last four years has gone by quite fast. The pandemic uh, ensuing and not meeting in person. Uh, yeah. Um, I've learned a lot in four years. And yeah, I just want to appreciate you guys taking your I mean, you, you guys have to do this. I want to appreciate you guys, <laughs> my other fellow commissioners. We all bear a, a brand now that we walk forward forever, being a planning commissioner and knowing what that means as we reach close to 11 o'clock tonight. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure. And um, you know, maybe I'll see you guys uh, around the corner somewhere. Thanks. Thank you. I just also wanted to thank staff. You guys have been so responsive and um, just very, very professional. And um, it's really, really appreciated. I know it's your job, but you all do it very well and it's much appreciated. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you both too. I, um, you know, I've, I've worked in a number of jurisdictions and um, I can really say that, that both of you, everybody on the commission for that matter, I, I can tell really takes the time to read the reports and puts a lot of thought into your decision making. and that doesn't always happen in other jurisdictions. So really appreciate the input and thank you for your service. All right, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Made it. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> it's, not it's not a record either. <laughs> no resolutions.